Big Tech's ordinance has everything from complete firearms to OEM and aftermarket parts. If you're looking to put together your first AR-15, they have everything from those parts that you need to the tools that are going to be essential. If you're looking for suppressors, night vision, handheld lights, weapon lights, sights or optics, you name it, Big Tech's has it all. Not only that, they're offering all those brands that we like. Go visit them at BigTechsOrdinance.com. Lucky Gunner carries ammo for sale and only offers in-stock cheap ammo with fast shipping. Whether you're looking for rifle ammo, handgun ammo, rimfire ammo, or shotgun ammo, you've come to the best place on the internet to find it all in stock and ready to ship. Lucky Gunner also has the popular Lucky Gunner Labs, which provides side-by-side comparisons of the best defensive ammunition available today. If you need ammo, and really we all do, check out luckygunner.com. Overwatch Precision is a team of civilians and combat veterans based in Phoenix, Arizona, that employ industry-leading production methods, coatings, and materials in their striker-fired polymer-framed pistol trigger systems. With an internal engineering team focused on thoughtful design, Overwatch's flat-faced and curved triggers safely deliver a mechanical advantage to your carry or duty Glock, Walther, CZ, P10, and Smith & Wesson MMP 2.0 with improved function and increased accuracy. See more at overwatchprecision.com. Filster makes awesome holsters. But not only that, they also happen to be one of those companies that are trendsetters. A lot of their designs are emulated by other companies. Not only does Filster make those holsters, but they also provide concealment systems like the Enigma, the Flex. They also have a lot of solutions when it comes to concealment solutions for medical. If you need to have a concealment first aid kit, they happen to sell them. Check them out at filsterholsters.com. Are you a professional looking for a reliable and high-quality rifle suppressor? Look no further than Primary Arms Government, whether you're equipping a team or shopping for your personal rifle. Primary Arms Government offers a complete selection of field-proven suppressors with options to fit any rifle and any budget. They work directly with the industry's leading brands to secure the best prices and available inventory, and their expert staff is always available to answer any questions you may have. Don't compromise on the safety and effectiveness of your equipment. Choose Primary Arms Government for all your suppressor needs. Visit them online today at primaryarms.com slash government. Walther is the performance leader in the firearms industry, renowned throughout the world for its innovation since Carl Walther and his son Fritz created the first blowback semi-automatic pistol in 1908. Today, the innovative spirit builds off the invention of the concealed carry gun with the PPK series by creating the PPQ, PPS, and the Q5 match steel frame series. Military, police, and other government security groups in every country of the world have rely on the high-quality craftsmanship and rugged durability of Walther products. Walther continues its long tradition of technical expertise and innovation in the design and production of firearms. For more information, visit WalterArms.com. So, episode 377. We're going to be, no, 378. We're going to be talking about lever guns. I have a panel to talk about lever guns. We have a couple guys who work specifically with them, have a lot of experience. Um, this is actually a topic. Lee, how long ago was it that I approached you about this? It's been a while. Oh, we did an episode several years ago where we talked about them. Uh, probably three or four years ago by now. And And now... With this explosion on on uh, Shot Show, this is the year of the lever gun, obviously, because I was told recently <laughs> that last year was the year of the revolver. So, yeah. yeah. But the cool thing about lever guns is they're uh, they are it's an older design, but it's still viable. You can still do a lot of really cool stuff with it. Steve Fisher kills a lot of stuff with lever guns on a regular basis. It's possible to modify them to whatever you need except for some auto fire that's something else but yeah um so a so, couple of things we can discuss today and i'm sure the discussion will go off in all kinds of directions uh caliber choice um because with these you can go you can go pretty dang big it's yeah pretty large calibers are available um but you can even so i have a uh 357 that rossi sent to me and that is just such a fun little lightweight thin uh lever gun and shoot 38 through it no problem 
Uh, I had a lot of cops shoot that, and they all said, I want to get one of these. And then several of them said, this is the, I want to get one of these for my son for his first rifle. So good, good stuff. Um, I think we will still do quick little background stuff. My ba- my background's in law enforcement, been doing the cop thing since last century. Uh, always had a fascination with firearms. And it's uh, this has been a really cool journey. We've been going at this for, we're approaching 10 years now. So let's get some more backgrounds, starting with Steve Fisher. Oh, industry dude, firearms instructor, trainer guy, product development, design, uh, input on a lot of things over the years that a lot of people have touched. Uh, most notably recently that got a big stir was the um, Palmetto State Armory 570 shotgun. That was uh, one of my big brain trust items this uh, past year that we uh, I didn't know got that. brought in on. Yeah, that was my kid. That, that, was, uh, that, that was my child. That was kind of fun. That was a great time. Uh, the boys called me up and we went in and worked on that. And then, uh, you know, six, seven months later, there it was. It was kind of neat to see. But, you know, optics, um, guns, firearms, mounts, all kinds of little weird stuff. Big hunting background as well. Uh, you, you know, grew up as a standard Michigan kid. Had a, had a shotgun and a rifle my entire life. Hunted with 22 lever guns to lever guns to, you know, big caliber stuff. I've taught lever guns to specific people going on hunts. I've taught them for people using them for self-defense in occupied territory states that weren't necessarily keen about having a shotgun specifically because of, you know, shotgun recoil, evil, bad. Um, so yeah, I've done a lot of that over the years and I know Lee's been doing it for a long time as well, but, um, just, it's an outstanding setup. It is a great gun. It is often bypassed, unfortunately, for a lot of other things. And here we are, like we talked about years ago, where this is kind of the current trend, I will say of where we are at right now. Yeah. And the cool thing about these trends is people can rediscover or for the first time discover the utility and how cool these are. Um, it may not fit everyone's needs, but it's for me personally, it's it's nice to understand how some of these systems work and figure out, okay, how does this apply to me? Lee? I am Lee Weems. I am the host of the number one podcast that's recorded in my kitchen. That is that is just that Weems Gal show. Uh, I, I guess I should say recorded and produced because I'm on primary and secondary every now and then, and it by, is by far the number one that gets recorded in my kitchen. Uh, I've been policing since the last century. I'm in year 26 now. Uh, for 12 years, I was the chief deputy of a sheriff's office in Georgia, and the very first policy that I wrote upon being appointed to that position was the approval of center-fire lever guns as patrol rifles because I wanted to carry Marlin 336. And what is the point? of being a chief unless you can do stuff like that. Exactly. <laughs> that, that's the only, that is the only upside. I want, I want ninja throwing stars approved. <laughs> yeah. Next month. Yeah. yeah that, that's the only upside. Um, I prefer lever guns for social uses. Uh, I have ARs because I have to, because of my line of work, because I have to teach them. Uh, be one of those things that if I retired, I would not be dissatisfied to see my ARs go away and keep my lever guns. Uh, just, but I don't, you know, say that just because that's my personal preference, not because I don't think that people should be allowed to have them or they need them. If you want them, fine. I actually like to go shoot pigs with my ARs. But yeah, you know, to each their own. It's just just a personal choice. Yeah, Fred. All right. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Weirdness with Zoom. I didn't update the, but uh, so Fred Lucas, uh, we're currently night vision for uh, all of uh, the government customers out of Crane. Um, Work small arms there. Used to teach the NSW gunners mates armors course at uh, well, I am, uh, you know, got that background. I was a paratrooper, uh, psychological warfare on active duty, one of the reserve units. But uh, I, uh, I'm mainly just an outdoorsman these days, and I, I carry a lever gun um, most of the time, and uh, they're still kind of a gray man uh, gun, and that's uh, uh, I joined here to learn more than to be a panelist so uh 
thank you, Matt, but I, I don't plan on saying much. No, that's fine. As a matter of fact, when I saw that you joined, I thought, oh, I want, I want to hear Fred's take on some of this stuff. Because a lot of times, <laughs> a lot of times you do join, not with any a, a, a expectation of joining the panel. And I just add you I'm like, oh, no, Fred's, <laughs> we're going to hear from yeah. Fred today. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. Brock? Hey, um, yeah, I go by Brock. Um, I have literally no background whatsoever. Uh, Lanford uh, felt Lanford. bad for another Utah boy and wanted to beat some culture into me. Hence, me bringing him on uh, this this lever lever gun one. I suspect I will be dragged onto the revolver one shortly thereafter. So yeah, like with Fred, I'll I'll probably I'll <laughs> probably try to listen, but then uh, as the night goes on, uh, I'll, I'll probably not shut the fuck up, even though. Um, I have literally nothing to add. It's kind of it's kind of what I do. <laughs> so apologies in advance. I'll be sure to alienate you all within uh, a couple hours. And you have uh, six times the amount of subscribers that I do. So they're all bots. Yeah, <laughs> sure, <laughs> sure. Jason. Yeah, Jason Closter. Um, I'm the senior VP at Lipsy's, and I do all the product development. So I handle all the special edition guns. I've been there uh, almost 26 years now. So I've kind of been in the industry for a while. Grew up hunting. I mean, that's kind of my passion. That's when I'm not, when I'm not working, I'm, I'm shooting stuff. So um, grew up really, t my dad was a huge lever action and revolver guy and pretty much grew up shooting lever guns. That was my, my first deer rifle was a Winchester, uh, big bore 94 and 375 Winchester when I was 11. So, I mean, that was kind of the, kind of how we, how we rolled with the oddball Winchester stuff. And then, Got into the Marlin stuff as I got a little bit older. I'm a kind of mildly obsessed with pistol caliber lever actions. Um, you know, anybody that tells you that the 454 Casul will kill everything in the world, well, I tell them, when you tell them a Rossi 45 Colt will do the exact same thing because a 300 mm -hmm. bullet at 1600 feet per second, doesn't matter if it's coming out of a revolver or out of a lever gun, they kind of look at you funny. You know, nobody would think that a, a you know, $500 lever gun could, could kill a Cape Buffalo, but it's just as capable as a 454 Casul pistol. And uh, so that's kind of my thing. I love hunting uh, the new Marlins. I've been shooting them quite a bit uh, here lately and been really impressed with them. Uh, I've hunted a lot with that new uh, 1895 SBL. We're seeing a huge uptick in lever action uh, sales, a lot of interest in it. Um, you know, every time we see a, a, a come down off of a big rise of ARs and, you know, polymer, you know, um, standard capacity pistol runs, when that, when that starts to fade off, we, we see that uptick again and back in revolvers and lever actions have really taken off. I think we said we saw, what, six or seven new lines of lever guns at SHOT Show this year. Um, so I think that, you know, that 50 state legal kind of thing has got a lot of people interested. And uh, I think guys like Steve out there that are teaching this stuff and showing people the way, I think people are starting to realize you can do, do pretty good work with these guns. Good stuff. And then somehow the planets aligned where I messaged Steve from Mad Pig Customs. And that was kind of the catalyst of this specific episode. Um, I don't remember if, it, if I recently saw some of his work because I already was familiar with the company, already have seen stuff. I don't remember if it was uh, Steve Fisher that posted something, but somehow got in contact with, with Steve here and started talking. And I think I initially just said, when are we going to do a podcast? So here's Steve. Hi, uh, so yeah, I'm Steve. I own Mad Pig Customs. We build custom lever action rifles, uh, primarily based off of Marlin and Henry pattern rifles. We've gotten into the Rossies, um, and I mean, we can go into details on like the models and stuff later, but uh, my background is, uh, so I'm a, I'm a senior NCO in the Connecticut Army National Guard. I've been doing that for the past 18 years. That's my full-time day job. Hmm. Um, and then uh, Mad Pig is a part-time job with a full-time workload these days yeah um so uh yeah we're expanding i just signed a new lease on a new 5500 square foot facility on friday and we're growing and doing a lot of really cool stuff at least i think we are so yeah i'm happy to be here and i'm glad you were glad you reached out to me yeah yeah good stuff okay steve as in fisher you had something that you wanted to break the internet with Oh, what could we, you know, it's funny to me that guys will talk about these guns. Like, like they brought something up that Steve from Mad Pig had said, we, we've talked about this before. We're, we're buddies. I own one of his guns. I'm going to get another one done probably in the next year. Um, 
the beauty of what people would consider the tactical lever gun, right? Modularity like anything else. Uh, for me, you know, hunting, night hunting, predator stuff, hogs, whatever the case is, just capabilities of the gun across the board, right? So when I look at one, um, like I'll take this one. This is one of uh, Lee's guns. It's a takedown 4570 from the Arms Room in Colorado. Lee does an amazing job on these guns. It's one of my other most favorite ones. Um, Maul right viz ir laser on the gun uh, i'll usually run qd mounts um with my setup and then that way it kind of get on there today right it allows me to go from the variable power low powered one to six with a red dot for passive shooting etc cetera, etc cetera, and so forth and then on certain hunts i'll just get rid of that guy right and throw my aim point t1 t2 m5 whatever on the gun to use it with nods um, obviously adding a suppressor to it's going to help. It's not blinding with the muzzle flash because of hunting ammo and low flash powder. And regardless of what the internet's going to tell me that I can't do with it because I'm the one who's actually done it with the gun. I'm wrong, but capabilities of the gun, right? Modularity, the rail gives us this, uh, you know, excess Ashley slash whoever for all these years have been, has done a rail, right? Scout scope type rail setup. It's not new, right? It's just new to other people, People, right? So we can definitely take the capabilities of the gun, increase them with the current technology that we have between lasers, dots, scopes. Um, even when I talk about it, because one of my other rifles upstairs that's is set up, but I just kind of grabbed this one as an example, right? Clip on night vision. I slapped that on. This is one of the Mad Pig guns. It's some weird blue color that he did because I said, I don't care, just do it in a color. And I got this weird navy blue, gray, something strange color. But anyhow, um, this is set up with obviously one, one of Knight's White Foss clip-ons and a Night Force optic. You know, I've, I've killed plenty of critters with this setup. Uh, you know, obviously it's, it's it's great. It's expensive, a lot of capabilities, but you wouldn't have been able to do this before without the Midwest rail systems, right? Especially when adding on clip-on devices or lasers. It's obviously a little bit better, I think, having the entire rail system integrated in with the handguard for maintaining accuracy. So th there's a lot of stuff you can do with these. Somebody's just going to cry about this because they're going to be like, that's like $20,000 in a gun. Like, yeah, well, whatever. Um, and that's not the point, right? The point is we can go as simple as we want or we can go as increased capability as you would ever want with these guns. It, it's, it, it's, it's a budget thing more than anything else and what you want the gun to be. So... Good stuff. I remember seeing Buck Thomas's 4570 years and years ago with a T1 big yeah. loop. I don't yeah. remember what else was on it, but I thought, what a cool concept. Yeah. And that just makes so much sense. And then to see how things have progressed since. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And don't get me wrong. I still like shooting my iron sight guns. Like, yes. like they're still fun, right? Like I still like shooting my, my standard old, whatever, either from 22s, 44, 40s, 45 long, 44 mags, 357 mags. I love them as uh, as Jason was commenting on, like uh, the, the guys at Ross, he got so tired of me two years ago when I got, especially Brett, we were just laughing about it uh, the other night, but on a conversation, but I took that 357 Rossi out. I came in two weeks before the opener of my gun season here in Michigan. I threw a, you know, a little spark solar vortex dot on the thing. And I proceeded to go out and massacre whitetails like crazy and coyotes that year. And another good friend of ours, Mike Fisher, uh, who's a good buddy as well. He's like, so what ammo are you going to shoot out of this thing? Da, 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 da. I was like, 158 grain American Eagle red box jacketed soft points, man. Yeah. Nothing fancy. And everything that has been within 75 yards of me has been stone cold, drop dead. And guys just laugh at that. I'm like going, hey, man, I'm, I'm pushing you know nearly 1,700 feet per second with that round out of these guns. You know, I've tried all the fancy stuff. That's great. Um, but I'm like, Man, good old chunk of jacketed lead still does wonders and for everything that I use them for, even for my 44s, 45 long colt, et cetera. And yeah, I've, I've killed a lot of whitetails with that load and some pigs. And I even got a buddy of mine stunned into a whitetail big doe this year during late season with it for their first deer. And he's like, is this going to be okay to kill a deer with? I said, trust me, that will kill the deer just fine. 35 yards out, doe comes in, kid comes up, whack, smacks it, drops, flips, falls up, run, done, over. Couldn't be happier. Great guns. It's funny, you know, we talk about jacket soft points. That's the one area where, to me, a jacket and soft point shines is in a lever gun. Uh, you know, in handguns, you can't drop them fast enough to make them really do much. It just acts like a semi wide at that point. But you put in a lever gun, it's a whole different story. <laughs> that, uh, I feel so much stuff with that 270 grain gold dot 44 Magnum. Uh, oh, jacket. great load. 
that that bullet and when it hits stuff it just handles them to the ground and it's and it's you know my kids shoot my kids when they were my oldest son his first deer rifle was a 77 44 bolt action 44 yeah. shooting that ammo yeah. and he had to shoot on like, the wall yeah when he killed that deer with he'd shoot that gun all day long and it was just no recoil and it just yeah. no fuss yeah. i mean it just it just kills yeah. stuff so great it's a, great guns good stuff well, well that's the thing a lot of people don't realize right like tailoring the loads like i had this discussion with some buddies this year about it because you know they're like Oh, we're going to use this particular lever action specified polymer tipped around, you know, the Hornady lever evolution. I'm like, hey, man, look, I got news for you. It is not the greatest thing on shooting little white tails with. Like, it's just, it's right, like, doesn't listen to me. And after the first one that he hit, we lost. We found it the next morning. But I was like, here, take some of these, you know, here's just some plain Jane old federal jacketed 300 grainer, blah, blah, blah. Like, Next year that showed up, just smacked it, crushed it, and over. I'm like, th th there's reasons why certain bullets perform certain ways in certain guns and barrel lengths and velocities and what they're designed for. And not everyone is a perfect match in these lever guns. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Steve, because that's one of the things that we've been seeing a lot lately, especially certain calibers are a little bit worse for that, right? 44 mag in particular yes. is super picky in lever guns. Oh. Like some of them, like, they just, I don't know if it's an expectation management too, or an experience mm -hmm. thing, like where people that are new to the guns, we've seen it before. They're like, well, I'm getting like a two inch group at a hundred. I'm like, good for you. That's, That's awesome. awesome. You're doing good, buddy. No, but I'm doing like clover leaf with my 4570. I'm like, those are two different bullets, my guy. <laughs> Way like, different bullets, different BCs, everything, right? I mean, everything. big chunk of flat stuff. And then there's this pointed, uh, uh, yeah, people just cracking up with that. It's like, one of the problems anyway, too with the Magnum is there's so many different twist rates out there. You got everything from one in 20 to one in 38. And guys are not necessarily pairing the right bullet weight to their uh, twist rate. Oh, you know? but, but is it in my 20 inch oh, yeah. gun or is it in my 16 and a half inch gun with, with that yeah. twist rate? Or is it in my 24 inch octagon barrel, one in 38? Right. Yeah, there's a lot of variability there. And a lot of people, especially novices, I find they try to shoot the real lightweight stuff because they say, oh, I can drive it really fast. And really, you got, in my opinion, <laughs> You shoot the heavy, heavy for caliber stuff in, in the rifles. Yeah. 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 Fragmentation yeah, I mean that, becomes a real issue. Yeah. yeah, lever guns are one of those things where guys like who are just getting into it, right, are, especially now, like the market is, in my opinion, different, right? Mm. Guys who are buying guns from me generally want something that they have seen that looks cool, you know, and look, I'm, I'm all for that. I think that's great, but, um, they don't have a lot of experience, you know, and yeah. when they get a gun like that, they're like, okay, well now what? So they go out and they buy $5 around 45, 70 and they're, that's all they can find, or they don't know any better. Like it's a difficult thing for people that are used to the AR AK pistol world where you can buy whatever's on the shelf and it's probably going to do okay. Yeah. Lever guns are not that way. Um, for a whole host of reasons, like we've already kind of touched on. Yeah, I won't even get into my big horn, <laughs> my big horn rifle either. Yeah, I mean that 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 they're, they're all they all have their own specific poison, right? And like I tell guys, like yeah. I've got a collection of forty five seventies. I'm like, I would just like to be able to buy one bullet off the shelf and shoot that same load in all my forty five seventies, right? I would just like to be like, the, like arbitrary round, like yeah, I would love to shoot some federal premium, like like hammer down right in the 300 grainer i would love to shoot that round in all my guns but i've got one that likes it one that doesn't one that doesn't that's 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 the beauty of owning all these things well and it's wild too because some of these you know you could have one gun from henry a uh, henry x and you know 44 that likes one particular like 100 or uh 300 grain 44 mag and then you could have a big boy that also in 44 mag that just absolutely hates it and yeah it's like there's kind of no rhyme or reason to it sometimes it's just they're just kind of picky yeah i did an experiment I, some. I was working up a hand load from that 77 44 once my son got a little older I was to load some full power stuff and i was i had a, i was shooting um some 280 grain wide flat and it was lbt bullets which was a great bullet for that gun and when I was working on my H110 loads, I was kind of going half a grain increments, half a grain increments. And it was mm -hmm. funny. It would shoot about three, three and a half inches. 
Then at 21 and a half grain, it just went to an inch. I'm like, all right, we're on to something. And then, so, so let me, I had already had loaded them up to 22 grains. So let me try that one and open back up again. And then I repeated mm -hmm. that test like multiple times. It just for whatever reason, everything worked perfectly with that particular grain weight, bullet, diameter bullet. And that's another thing we get in the cast bullets. You know, you, you can size them different sizes, you know, 429, 430, 431. You can play around with that. Um, but you start at, at 21 and a half grains, it all of a sudden, man, everything just fell together. And mm -hmm. so you almost have to treat each, like John Taffin always says, hey, every gun's a law to itself. And you just kind of have mm -hmm. to treat it. Don't necessarily discount your gun if it doesn't like the first load you put in it, because you might have to play around with it a little bit. And, and don't necessarily discount these things because you started at this distance and the round hasn't stabilized until you hit B distance. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is a very real quarter. thing. Everybody thinks it should shoot a quarter inch group, you know. So. Well, my AR does. Come on. <laughs> right. I, I've, I try I've to explain so that to guns. people. There's so many different factors interacting on a lever gun, you know, with barrel harmonics and just, I mean, how many different dovetails are cut into the barrels? And then you got like, it, they're just, they're not the same. Um, And I mean, I don't know, I'm probably partially responsible for people thinking they are because we make them look a certain way, but it's, it's, there's definitely an education piece to it. Um, A lot yes. of people don't necessarily like that. <laughs> They are not what I would consider the average. I mean, like if they're going to take the gun out and play with it and blast with it, it's great, right? Like it, it's nothing wrong with that at all. But like when it gets time to like seriously start killing animals and other social work with this gun, there there is a learning curve to very specific ammunition. I I killed, geez, a lot a lot of deer this last year because I picked up a used Marlin eighteen ninety four and forty four mag at a local gun show for like five hundred fifty bucks this year, like dirt cheap, like stole it. Nice score. Yeah, and I'm like. You know, you're going through the shelf, right? Like American Eagle, I've got some, you know, I've got 300 grain XTPs. I've got 225 XTPs. I've got all these bullets. I'm like, okay, these three rounds shoot good. First deer that I shot with one of those particular rounds at about 45 yards looked at me. Just looked at me wrong. I was like, well, <laughs> what, what are you doing? You're supposed to fall down at this point, right? Like, yeah, no, I was like, you just poked a hole through me, bro. Like, it did nothing. I'm like, oh, my God, this is not going to go good with this particular pointed polymer jet bullet at this point, you know? It just did not do well. And I'm like, okay, great. Got it. You know, went back to the truck, you know, finally ran that one down. Eventually, I'm like, Magtech, 240 grain semi jacketed flat points. Went over <laughs> to the range real quick. Yep, these are, these are going to be great. Came back that afternoon hunt and absolutely smacked three does right to the ground between zero and 125 yards with it. I'm like going, I, I don't even get it anymore, right? But again, it goes back to that thing. Like there's just certain rounds that perform very well in these guns and do it a lot better than everybody else's magical bullets. Yeah. So, so you guys brought up social work. Lee, mm. in your experience using these for social purposes, what are, thing, <laughs> what, are, what are some things off the top of your head that you've learned that you like to share with people that what, they want to use them defensively? They might want to use it for a patrol rifle. Sure. Um, well, first, let me kind of say what got me into the lever gun yeah. and then why I kind of progressed that way. Uh, and I make it a little emotional over part of this. Uh, when I really? was 14, 14 years old, uh, my father went into the hospital and did not come home for weeks. And uh, I grew up on what was my family's dairy. Uh, but my father and I were raising horses on it at the time. And you know, he went into the hospital, did not come home for several weeks. We had three mares due to fall any day now, you know, back then. Um, he had a first cousin that lived a couple of miles from us. They were very close. He was tighter with him than he was his brother. And the first cousin showed up for several days because I was left to take care of everything at home. Uh, after three or four days, he quit showing up because I was able to take care of everything without any help and one day he picks me up and there's a uh old glenfield model 30 in 3030 laying in you know in the seat of the truck he says yeah take that i'll tell your daddy you're you're ready for it and it's to, to me that was the elders of my tribe this one's going to be okay yeah you've earned it here you go 
Uh, I don't have that rifle anymore because his uh, son-in-law wanted to go deer hunting. And they asked, hey, can Paul borrow that rifle? And I have not seen Paul or the rifle since. Mm. And that was probably 40, you know, 40 something years ago at this point. We can we can uh, find them. Uh, I'm not worried about it. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm still in high school at the time. And so I had a part time job and I had enough money saved up and I went down to a local pawn shop and picked out a Marlin 336. And my father went by and signed the paperwork uh, so I could have it. And you can't prosecute him for a straw purchase because he's no longer with us. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, I still have that rifle. That was the only center of fire uh, firearm that I owned for a long time. Uh, years later, I end up going to the police academy, uh, start doing the law enforcement thing, become a firearms instructor, go to the shotgun instructor course. And I look over at that lever action rifle one day and I go, you know what? That pump shotgun that I've been doing a lot of work with has got a tube and you manually operate it. Huh. That lever action rifle has a tube and you manually operate it. Let me go see if these loading techniques and everything that I learned with the shotgun will work on this rifle. Lo and behold, they worked. I don't need a magazine fed rifle. Was my was my point of view. It wasn't until agencies started doing the patrol rifle thing and I'm responsible for teaching it that I started getting, you know, box fed magazine rifles. Uh, I really like the lever action platform for for law enforcement use for one primary reason is that you don't have the height of a bore issue that you have with the ARs. It's pretty much point of aim, point of impact across the room. Um, the downside is, is that if you jack around into the chamber, now you have the hammer cocked and we have to decock de the lever under stress. Uh, that's the one downside that I see. Uh, as I have gotten older, seeing the sights has become yeah. Uh, an issue that it used to not be. I used to think that the buckhorn sight was the greatest invention in firearms, and now I don't quite quite the same high opinion of it. You don't quite see do. that anymore. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I have a hard time seeing that. That that the old standard Marlin 336 sight was there's no need, for, there'll never be any need for anything else. And then I got old. Uh, I do chop the stocks down a little on a gun that I'm going to use for social purposes, just like I did wood on a shotgun. Um I think is just an outstanding platform because I don't buy into this whole, you gotta have all this capacity and everything. It's great. If you want it, that's fine. I, I got ARs. I got bunches of magazines. I, I'm, I'm in the club. Uh, I'm just not an officer in the club. Um, I wrote an article back when one of the, the sales crunches went on, like everything black rifle was out of every store. And I walked into one and the only thing that you could get that was a quote black rifle in the store was stuff that was NFA and you couldn't walk out the door with it. But there was two rows full of used lever guns mm -hmm. in the store. Now that's no longer the case. Uh, so that, that article is not aged in that regard. But I walked over and there were still functional lever guns on the shelf for 250, 300 bucks back then. And this was probably 2012 ish. And so I wrote an article about using the lever action as a patrol rifle. And I got hate mail over the thing. How dare you? You're going to give people the opinion. You think that this is a viable patrol rifle. Well, good. Because I was trying to give people the opinion. Because it, it is. Yeah, still, viable, it's still a viable gun. <laughs> a viable patrol rifle. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I, I guarantee you that none of those guys in North Hollywood would have turned down a Marlin 336 or Winchester 94 had you called up beside them and handed it to them. Uh, I had a buddy that was working in a rural county nearby that had gotten pinned down in the woods and he had an 870 and the other guy had an AK-47 and they stayed there for a while until people with rifles got there to bail him out. It's like, hey, hey, Dave, if I had crawled up beside you and handed you a Winchester 94, would you have been glad to have it? He's like, oh yeah, I would have been glad to have it. Well, I live in the Southeast. People of my generation, every last one of us has an old Winchester 94, 336 that belonged to granddad. It's like standard issue here. And my line of thinking was, you know, if you're going out on patrol right now and you can't walk into a store and buy 
you know, black rifle at the time, you could go get your deer rifle and go to work with it. You still do good work. Uh, you know, times have changed now, and and, and that's not the, the case anymore as far as the availability goes, but the overall concept still works. I mean, think back to it, Lee. How, how long has a lever gun been used in law enforcement? Oh, since about day one, since it was ever yes. designed, developed, and brought. Like, it is the original patrol rifle, basically, outside of like a sharp. So, right. you, you know, I mean, that's it. It's, it's been here forever, man. Right. For the private citizen, you take a standard 336 1894. Mm -hmm. All right. That doesn't have the same jury impact that the evil black rifle has. The prosecutor standing there and holding it up in it. Well, that looks like granddaddy's rifle. And here's the one thing that I always get is people, you know, they love to throw out the John Wayne reference. It's America's gun. Yeah, the good guys always used the lever gun. And I always like, well, the bad guys in all those movies used them too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but, we <laughs> associate, but we associate them with the cowboy heroes. Mm hmm. And it's it's America's gun. And the the only downside that I see to them is other than having to decock the hammer under stress. Uh there's a couple of down one, if you have to do any kind of sustained sustained fire, they get hot in a hurry. Uh and they are kind of fragile. But I don't think most of us in a lifetime of deer hunting or having to use one for social purposes are going to wear out the gun to a point of fragility that the cowboy action guys wear them out. I don't think anybody else will. I don't know. So I, I'm actually going to kind of take a little bit of a different opinion uh, okay. because I agree with you. You're not going to wear them out. Yeah. The problem is in my experience, right? I see a lot of guns, a lot of lever guns from all different people yeah. like Steve's gun. When that came to me, <laughs> that gun did not work <laughs> and that was one of my favorite malfunctioning guns because i was like this is weird i wonder why this why why won't i drop the hammer what's going on um and one of the uniquely marlin problems is on their stocks um i don't have one in here but i've got hundreds of them they have two little ears right and those ears break and your guns Probably guns that you guys have in your safe right now are broken and you don't know it until you take it off and you look and you see, hey, this thing is cracked. Because that's the case on, I'm not going to say nearly every, but it's close. And what Steve's gun did is it broke and that piece of wood went in there and it got into the spring um, and it blocked the hammer start entirely. Yeah. Now that's a fairly unique circumstance. Um, yeah. I have seen, I mean, there, there's a lot that can go wrong in a lever gun. There just is. Uh, I've seen the lifter, carrier, whatever you want to call it. Um, I've seen them bent. Those wear gun. out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had a, uh, we had a brand new gun that we did, a brand new Marlin 1895. Uh, and it went to... Well, fuck it. it. It went to Donald Trump Jr. Um, but he was on the campaign trail for his father at the time. So this is going back a few years. And the place where we sent the shop we sent it to, I don't know what happened or who touched it. But like six months later, when he finally picks up the gun, he's like, hey, man, this thing won't like there's something really wrong with this. And I'm like, all right. So, you know, we, we send him a box. It comes back. The carrier was bent like, cause, you know, the carrier is supposed to be straight mostly right thing was mm -hmm. bent because somebody just hulk smashed on the freaking lever when they Bad. didn't know what they were doing and i don't think it was him um because he picked the thing up and it didn't work you know one of the unfortunate things with at the time the guns that we built is they were still kind of new and everybody wanted to look at them and then they break them um but <laughs> I, there's just an awful lot that can go wrong in a lever gun that mm -hmm. uh mm. They're just not as they're not what people make them out to be. I I think they have that revolver myth to them, of the ultimate reliability is a thirty eight snub nose, 
It's like, man, you ever taken a revolver apart? Have you seen the lock work inside? Do you know what timing is? Because none of that happens on my mm -hmm. clock. Not to the same extent. Like, they're just yeah. different. Um, and I think that's something that people, again, education piece, people need to understand. There's a reason that these designs are old and have been surpassed. Um, that doesn't mean they're bad guns at all. I don't think that's the case, obviously. But I think people need to understand the limitations of the design. I mean, revolvers like fail at a staggeringly high rate um, uh, when you put them on a, like a gun range, right? Where they see a high round count without a lot of maintenance. Uh, they fail ridiculously at high rates. Everything breaks. The, so the, the frame, I'm, I'm not a big revolver guy. I mean, yeah. probably half the reason I'm here. Um, but yeah, oh my God, the amount of times we're just like, well, sick. This gun has X number of live rounds in it and it's completely jammed up and it's just sitting there like... And the hammer is halfway, halfway to falling. Like, who, who wants to have it's fun? It's unnaturally, with this one? It's like, yeah. Honestly, I, I got a ten-hour shift tomorrow. I'll handle this one. Like, you know, there, there's no downside to this goes right bad. Um, yeah. If you, if you don't mind, ask uh, if I kind of, kind of interject there. Uh, where is, I don't know if this is Steve one or Steve two. Um, from my perspective, as a complete, you know, scrub lordian. Uh, the panelist here regarding lever guns i can't like to me all guns are fun right like i have a blast whatever gun you put in my hand unless it's like a single stack nine mil gun then i'm going to probably turn that on myself but you know like an lcp or something but short of that right like all guns are fun to me i have i i feel that passion with any gun that i run so lever guns are cool but a big question i have over and over again is you know like for example on primary and secondary we we, rec uh, we you guys generally recommend uh you know certain you know optics over other optics certain brands over other brands and it usually comes down to the fact that there is a performance enhance Ooh. over you know x versus y right there's a reliability enhance over x worth worth uh, versus y in the context as you've elegantly put it of like social calls like what is that what is that niche that the lever gun scratches, right? Like sell me, sell this is the elevator pitch. Sell me on it as someone right. that wants to get into lever guns because they're the coolest fucking things ever. But I can't help but see them as uh, sort of antique guns. Now they absolutely work, but l revolvers work. You know, Lee Enfield number fives work, right? These are big fucking bullets coming at pretty high speeds. But for someone that wants to stack the deck in my favor, Right. What is that? Like, obviously, they're not going to be as fast as a semi-auto. But what is that niche? What is that scratch, that itch that gets hit by the lever gun that nothing else can get that says, hey, maybe put one of these in your gun safe and, and, and try it out. Get get good at it. Right. Because that that's the other aspects. You guys, you know, grew up with lever guns. You've, you've lived this life. I've never really run a lever gun beyond a certain amount. So to me, to get to a point where I can safely run a lever gun, or it's, it's like with a shotgun. Right. You don't know what you're doing with a shotgun. You're gonna get fucked up really fast if you tr start trying to run that that um, run the uh, trying, the pump. trying to do what run, run the pump. You know, oh, understandably, man. most of us as guys are pretty good at that. But you hand it to a woman, they're gonna be lost, right? So like, bite running... your tongue. I just got done teaching a shotgun class with a whole bunch of women that have their first time touching an eight seventy. Just because you got shitty instructors in your life who don't know shit about a gun doesn't mean you should preach that shit. You're as bad as the rest of the internet. Stop talking. Anyway, go ahead. Carry on. <laughs> I was going to say that was a masturbation joke, but, um, you know, I know. That, I, never mind. <laughs> I know. Maybe, maybe the ladies do understand that concept <laughs> a little more than I thought, but, uh, yeah, ultimately what I'm getting at, there's, there's a learning curve to get into a lever yeah. gun. Like sell me on why I should spend the huge amount of money. Lever guns are pricey, right? The wonderful ammo's question. Training is pricey. Like sell me. Uh, on, right? it's a wonderful I'll, I'll question. Give, one quick selling point on lever guns is that you can use, especially in pistol caliber lever guns, any level power of ammunition. I can take this Marlin 1894 357 right here. I can take this gun. I can put the lightest 38 special ammo in here, all the way up to the heaviest 200 grain hard cast 357 Magnum ammo. Kill rabbits to to the biggest game you want to shoot with it. You got different re recoil levels. It's easy to train on. It's uh, with a rimfire, especially. You, that's the only really gun that you can shoot shorts. Longs, long rifles, all through the same gun, through that tubular magazine. So it just has a lot of versatility in the types of ammunition and power levels you can use, as opposed to, and you can't do that with a semi, 
I mean, you know, you can shoot subsonic or supersonic during a blackout, but even that can be a little, can a little funky at times. But even like my 4570s, I've got everything from 400 grain bullets running 900 feet per second that I'm running suppressed. It's as quiet as just about as anything as you want to mm -hmm. shoot all the way up to 430 grain hard cast bullets running 1850 out of that thing. You can kill anything in the world. with. So yeah. Yeah, that's where lever guns really shine is in ammunition power levels out of one gun. That's an but interesting yeah. point on the training aspect, because I've done a lot of training for um, what we'll, we'll call them suboptimal in terms of like from a teacher student perspective, where, you know, they're not going to go home and put the hours upon hours upon hours into it. And you need to get as much bang for buck in a short amount of time. And the most effective way I found that is kind of, as you mentioned, you start with the the, the weaker variant of the gun and, and scale up, right? With with revolvers, you can kind of do the, the 380 special, then three, 357, you know, graduation. And with AR-15s, like you've been kind of relegated to trying to set up a, a, a Smith 1522 and then move them to an AR-15. And it's kind of weird. So that that is an interesting point because that, that's a very effective way about going about it, right? You delete the recoil at first, you get used to the ergos and then you punch them into the, to like the real deal. And then suddenly it's not so big of a deal because the gun's not actually recoiling that much in the grand scheme of things. Right. Even the heavy loads out of the pistol caliber rifles are not abusive soft. at all. Soft. Yeah, soft. Real soft. The, the other part of it is too, right? Um, just because what you want isn't what somebody else needs. Um, when you look at things, right, you, you look at the people that I've taught with these guns in, like I said, the occupied territory states where even particular shotguns are verboten, yeah. right? It's not going to go well being in upstate New York, somewhere in New York with your 1301 fully decked out looking like an AR, right? It's it's not going to, it's not going to sit well. Uh, but if I, but if they grab a wood stock, like Lee's talking about as well, and they've got a wood stock 357, 38, 44 mag, whatever, lever gun, 45 long colt, octagon barrel, whatever it may be. Hey, man, like this is perfectly acceptable 50 plus state gun, wherever, whatever you choose to do with it, right? So it, just because we think or we feel we have this pipe dream of what this whatever is going to happen in our world is going to look like, that we need a, realistically, when you look at the facts, the data and everything else involved, like you're like, yeah, man, I can do a lot with a lever gun, right? In a very short period of time, very rapidly. Like I have shot pigs moving little armored tanks with a lever gun in very rapid succession with a red dot on this thing, right? And or a laser under nods, but different story. But yeah, like you, you, you'd be surprised at what some baseline, just factually good training with the gun and some dry fire will do. And that's ultimately how I ended up breaking my other 4570 was a lot of dry fire and a lot of shooting like a lot of shooting and a lot of dry fire, but that's what we do with any of these things. And it's more of a matter of just understanding again, what, you know, what is the role for you, right? If it's a fun gun, then you go out and you buy one in 38, 357, you get a Rossi, you know, relatively inexpensive in the grand scheme of things right now, or you find some used one if ever possible. And you just go have fun with the gun. Not every gun is a serious working gun. Not every gun is my end of the world doomsday okay bunker and do shit gun it's just fun man like like my blr 22 like browning lever action 22 man like what do i do with that thing that is my decompression gun when i'm tired of shooting and teaching and trying to be serious and i go to the range and i go find empty shotgun shell halls on the range and clay pigeons and whatever else and i just go plink with the gun and have fun man not every gun is a serious quote unquote working gun, even though quite capable, a 22 long rifle with 16 rounds in it, a lever gun. I'll do a lot of work full of mini mags. Like I'm, I'm not going to kid you on that, right? If I needed to, but again, what do you want it to do and why, you know, it's not, it's not the gun that everybody wants. And, but there are places where it is a very viable gun, especially on the East coast and a lot of States, uh, you know, Pacific Northwest right now in some states there that I teach pretty heavily in, but you know, a lot of guns there are now no go for people to get because of the bands there and the progression of what they can and can't buy in states. And one of my buddies is like, Hey man, like, I, like I, I need to get something done. I'm like, here's what you need to go buy. Like go get yourself a Rossi or a Marlin or somebody in 357 mag. They make this cool little light mount for it from, I think Hill people still makes it that you can attach a TLR to the gun. Congratulations. Buy this box of 135 grain gold dot or whatever else is floating around that you can find. Go forth and conquer the world. Zero to 25 yards or 50 yards. Go practice with it. There's not much else you need at that point. 
Well, Lee made a good point earlier about the lack of offset too. You take a and, and the cool thing is you take like a like a, a Winchester eighteen ninety two. That's got a really small, tidy action. So you take a sixteen inch barreled eighteen ninety two or an eighteen ninety four Marlin. You got a really short, handy gun, especially if you cut the stock down a little bit, to, like you would a shotgun. Now you got a gun that's super, super short. You're not any no NFA bullshit, and you um, you know. It, it's very handy and you know 25 you're not having to oh they'll have this three inch offset it you know at 10 yards or 25 yards and then all this kind of stuff it's just you know point and shoot and it's right on there and mm -hmm. it really makes a really tidy handy especially in and out of a vehicle like i keep this little marlin 357 as my little truck gun and man when i'm you know in the wood going out hunting and stuff i can't tell you how many times i've jumped out of, out of the truck to shoot a pig or something like that and it's just much quicker and handier to manipulate than an AR-15 or an AK or the myriad of other guns that I've tried to do it with. I find that these little tidy lever actions do that better than anything. It's one of my favorite side-by-side -side ATV guns. You know, I used to carry around, you know, a beater AK for years in one because nobody cared about it, you know, an old Century Arms beater one. But I was like, why am I doing that when I can have this thing sitting in here all the time? You know, so I just I, I run around with that thing with a lever gun and the ATV half the time, the side-by-side. Definitely. So I'll kind of give you my perspective, which is a little different than your guys. I mean, my my background is rather different. So I'm from one of those states. I'm from Connecticut. My shop is 20 minutes from the original Marlin North Haven factory. We've had bands here for most of my life. I'm 38. And uh, for me, I didn't grow up with a lever gun. You know, I, I did not. I grew up shooting competition small bore. And then I got so burned out and tired of that as a young teenager that I didn't want to shoot anything. It just wasn't fun for me anymore. And then I joined the army and found ARs were fun and bought him from Waddle One Sales and you know, never looked back. <laughs> when I started doing um, lever gun stuff, it was my buddy Phil, who was a gunsmith or is a gunsmith, um, just happened to be really into Marlins. And so we started messing around with them. That's before Midwest came out with their stuff. Um, and I, I think I see a little bit, with my customers and the people I interact with, I see a little bit of the market a little bit differently from maybe from you guys, from the training perspective and stuff. Um, everybody's, I hear that story, the same story you guys told, like my grandfather had a lever gun and I grew up with that. And now I have it like, yeah, well, my grandfather had a lever gun too, but he was a New York city fire Lieutenant from Staten Island. So it's a little bit different, you know? Um, but for me, a lot of the guys that buy my guns, I, this is their first lever gun. They buy it because we make something that looks a little bit different and it's cool. And the biggest thing is it's not an AR. People are burned out on ARs. They tell me that Bingo. all the time. They're like, I got a million ARs. I don't need another one. I'm like, L I get it. Like not a lot of ARs over here, right? They're, they're down there, but um, I get that. Shooting a lever gun is a lot of fun. I'm like, just, like no bullshit. It's just a lot of fun. Something like about the manually operated gun gang. Like that's what me and Cody from Van Comp used to call it. Like it's yeah. just the manually operated gun gang, right? There's something visceral about operating the lever action rifle that makes it a lot of fun. It's just enjoyable. I don't think you're going to find a better suppressor host, right? Oh, yeah. Like that's kind of been glossed over, but suppressors and lever guns, I mean, Teddy Roosevelt was doing that shit. Like, yep. these are, they're <laughs> just awesome for that. Um, so I think they just kind of scratch an itch that a lot of people have because they want something different. They don't want another AR. They can suppress their ARs. They can suppress their AKs. But they're like, you know what? A lever gun's kind of cool. It's a little different. It's something to bring to the range. You know, I mean, they draw they're just attention. Fun. It's, it's just fun. Like, I cannot tell you how happy it makes me to hear talk steve talk about like fun guns not yeah. everything needs to be a serious gun it really, really doesn't you know and yeah. i mean i'm not giving up my ars for lever guns for social purposes right but i'm, I'm also not going to use my pkm like that doesn't make any sense to me I would. Uh, that sounds pretty cool. Like, dude, if you yeah, can rip right? one with a PKM. Bro, I live thinking. in Connecticut, all right? Like, this is, it, yeah. that's a problem. <laughs> it doesn't work. Right? That's exactly what the work. PKM is for, because you live in Connecticut. 
like like yeah. Illinois, Illinois, Connecticut, yeah. you know, some of the mass Maryland stuff. Like it's 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 bad. New York, you know, there's a lot of these places, man, and it's just not it. And like I tell guys, like I I'd be more than happy content with that Rossi 357 mag laying here in front of me, like all day. I will work this gun like it owes me money. <laughs> it's great. Yes. And and this is something that you can do with a Rossi 357. You yeah. know, you can put a laser on there. You got a red dot and it gives you options. Not everybody wants that. I get that. Oh, no, it's a purse One four. of the things I think is, what's that? Oh no, it's a purse four. <laughs> yeah. One of the things I think that is really overlooked, though, on lever guns, especially with, like, the modernized ones, I hate the term tactical, but, you know, whatever, yeah. is, and of course, I don't have one on here, but uh, is a hand stop. Yeah. Hand stops drastically change the feel of how you operate a lever gun because you're not gripping it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. You're not holding on to it. You're just pulling back a little bit, and now I can operate that lever. No problem. One of the things, like, you talk about training and education. Steve, how often do you see people that are inexperienced with lever guns? They fire. Dismount, remount, all the time. Why? Like, dude, it's just here. I, like, I, just keep going. <laughs> I, I, you know, like, like I, I, I used to have to show guys, like, a clip, of, like, on, like, when we used to do PowerPoint, like, original, like, old Western movies. And that guy's like, I'm like, look, you don't have to dismount this thing, right? It's, it's like shooting a scout rifle. You don't have to dismount the scout rifle either. Right. And that's the biggest thing. It, it, again, it's that lack of education process on it or a lot of YouTube videos or Instagram garbage, uh, you know, from the celebrity influencers or whoever, whatever that plays with these things. Like, hey, man, keep the thing shouldered, run the lever. It's you, you don't do it with your pump gun. Why do you do it with this? Well, the bolt comes back. I'm like, stop it, hero. Just stop yourself. Like, it's you're not going to blast yourself in the face with it. You're, you're actually going to be this and this. It, 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 it's a grand scheme, right? It, it, it's kind of comical to me to watch it, though, and to see where it's gone. And it's like, like I know me and Steve have talked about this. I don't know how many of his guns are floating around out there, but I'm the only one that ever sees any pictures with dead animals with his. Is like mine, you know. Like, I'm sure he gets them, but I'm the only one that actually takes them out and shoots shit with them. Yeah, I, I know you do. So yeah, he, you know. But but he's always right? sending me dead bison and like, yes, that shit's great. Like they just drop. And I was oh yeah! Like, wow, that's the thing, huh? Yeah, it's the yeah, human I version of your cat bringing uh, dead rats home. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I, every I time know. I walk into deer camp with this gun, it gets so many looks. Guys just like go, hmm. And the old lever gun guys kind of look at just strange, like Let's just go outside they and get shoot. So mad. Couple. I don't know how, how they I do feel about this. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep. I'm angry, but I also have a partial chub. I don't. What's going on here? Oh, it's amazing. They are so much fun, though. The, 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 oh why are we even talking about this because all well, the internet and it demands it anymore i guess but yeah lee you had something i just said so i noticed something on, on the rifle that he was just showing there uh the mad pig guy talking about people mad taking pig. it off of off of the shoulder running it. uh i understand why people that live in places that actually have cold weather like big loop lever guns but to me if you come in the south with the big loop lever it should be a felony uh, you should go to prison for that. Uh, it actually makes running the gun much, harder. much, much harder. Uh, Steve, let me walk you through you. something. Let, let me yep. let me walk you through something. Grab one with a regular lever on it if you got one handy. Yeah, most somebody got medium. Right they got right. some mediums. It'll be close. Right. It's a medium one. Do not put the pinky finger pinky in the finger. lever. Leave it laying out. Now you can rotate your wrist slightly and you get a straight back press on the trigger and also as if you're running that lever if you have to do like an over the top speed load into the chamber yeah. with the one open you can then clamp that pinky down on the lever and stabilize the gun while you do do work with it I, doing I, all I've that shown... with, yeah doing all that with a big loop lever is much more difficult and you yes. get that running start to rack your knuckles yeah uh, against the lever oh, yeah now again i live in a place where 38 degrees is considered like we need to start closing schools because the children you know, 38 freeze. degrees is short sleeve shirt so weather. right a lot um, of, a lot of times i'll show guys right yeah like you can just grab the whole lever itself yeah and, and i can mount with fire position on it too and it, it, it's, it's just options depending on hand size like like and i'm a big right. dude with big hands and even with big gloved hands i hate big loops i can't stand them yeah 
but I understand them for like cold yeah. weather hunting where you're going to have big gloves on, or I've heard of these things called mittens. I don't think that I've ever seen them in real life. They're great up here but in I've, Michigan when it's. I, yeah, I've seen pictures of them on the internet. That's uh, a Hollywood understand. construct. They don't, don't exist. Don't yeah. ever miss. <laughs> I, I understand why people that live in places where you actually have stuff like that would want the big loops. Yeah. But yeah, absolutely. for my world, I, it just, just doesn't. It's no, so it doesn't apply. Maybe the government so I, will give you a pardon if you come here with it. I don't know. I, I, so like I, I actually agree with you on that. And we, we just designed our own lever. And one of the things that we did with our lever, uh, Steve, you saw that, right? At, at the show, yeah. I think you did. Yeah. So the big loop lever, uh, and of course, I don't have one here at my house right now. Everything's at my shop. But to me, and speaking of little browning 22s, right? Yes. When you see if you can see it. So I got tiny little girl hands, especially compared to, you know, big Steve over there. But when you're banging your knuckles around on a lever, that's kind of dumb. I'm not a fan. Like when I see people putting paracord on their, on their big loops, it's like, well, that's because it's too big. You really don't need that. So what we did with ours is we actually have ours come out in kind of a medium profile. And again, I apologize. I don't have one, but it's flat um, Mm -hmm. on the, the knuckle side on the outside because what you do is when you're when you're working the lever realistically what most people end up doing is they rotate their hand like this right and when you do that you're just kind of pivoting and your pinky comes down right here and then you move and then you go back and when you have a big loop right like like you were just saying about the Rossi, because I agree, I hate this lever. I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what, like, look how much room there is there. Like, yeah. what is that doing for anyone? Like, I live where it's cold. I lived in Vermont you down. for many years, right? Like, this is dumb to me. Yeah. But people like it because of the cowboy shit, and don't even get me started about the spinning. But mm-hmm. so for me, with our lever, when I had to def- design my own lever, what we did is we made it so you rotate down. And then your knuckles are flat, right? Because this curve, yeah. I don't know a lot of people whose natural resting state of the, when they're trying to manipulate a lever is curved. That is an uncomfortable, like that's like a claw thing. Like it's just no good, right? Like if you try doing that with your hand right now, is that a comfortable position for your hand? No. Flat makes sense. And you're not your wrapping your knuckles all the time. It just fits because you're wedging your hand in the lever and then you're operating. So that, that's yeah. why we did ours the way we did. And I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense because I agree with you. I don't like big loops, you know. Yeah. It's just one more thing very well. take the woods too and open up on you when you least expect it. So not not I mean, diff- yeah, that's a that's a spring issue in my experience more than anything else. But like they they can catch on stuff. Like there's just yeah here's my other complaint like i won't say complaint but thing like like we learned years ago about like easy loading gates about an easy loading gate mod like easy loading gate mod is life right like like that makes feeding shells cartridges way easier right at this point it, it really truthfully does and I, you know, I look at a couple things and I, I talk to the guys at rossi about some stuff on this gun if it ever gets changed who knows it might it might not be taken into consideration, but even on all of them, like an, an open gate loading feature is money on a lever gun. Like, especially if you're gonna shoot any kind of matches with it, cowboy lever action, whatever the case is. Like I like an open loading gate system, especially wearing gloves with pistol caliber rounds because big paws, little bullets makes things a little bit more interesting, uh, versus you know, 45, 70, 30, 30, 30 getting into all the larger, more mainstream calibers. So for me, having an open loading gate or an easy loading gate feature is an absolute 100% must of my guns. So let, let me ask you then, what are your guys' thoughts on tube loading? Right? Because now mm. we have the new Smith & Wesson 1854 that doesn't tube load, it tube unloads, right? Right. And the Henry line. Well, yeah. first you got to take this source. One, it's Smith & Wesson. So two, hmm, um, yeah, but go ahead. Sorry. I don't have uh, any of the Henry products, and that's not the not a slam against Henry. It's just yeah. I don't have any. Uh, I've had a couple come through classes because I mandate that you must have a side loading gate on the gun. You have to use it in the class, uh, and there, as we know, the original Henrys did not have the side loading gate on it. 
I've had a couple of other guys come through with the Henry X. I think that's what they call it since they've come out yeah. that have both the loading gate and the tube. And I actually like that for like the initial load of the gun. My only objection to the tube having to tube load is that there's no way to top the gun off. Uh, and I really like that feature of being able to undo the mag tube and dump all the rounds out of it. Mm-hmm. I, I think that's a good design. Uh, unfortunately, every one of the Henry rifles that I've handled that have come to the classes had horrendous triggers on them. Absolutely god awful, horrendous triggers. Uh, to the point where the first one that I handled, I started checking to make sure to see if there was a safety engaged because I was pressing on the trigger so hard that the, and the hammer hadn't felt. I thought that I had done something wrong. Yeah. I'm not disagreeing with the hammer. I'm not a huge overall fan of tubes on what I would consider my like strong working hunting guns. Mm-hmm. Like I'm just not, I would, I would rather have the gun just be a side magazine, you know, fed. That's it. Like 22s. I understand a little bit more, right? Like my 22s, my fun guns. Absolutely. Yes. hundred percent on what I consider my, my harder use hunting working guns. Like absolutely not. It's just not a thing for me guys. Then you get guys trying to like do a, tactical reload for a better term or not you know and they pull the tube part way and they're trying to put rounds in like it's, it, it becomes a mess they're completely defeating the purpose of what we're trying to do with these guns right. you know, I, I just have to treat it like literally like what it is a shotgun at this point but for me yeah no i'm i'm generally pretty strong on being a side gate tube guy and my tube guns should be for 22s but i've seen enough of them come loose and get walked out and get lost one of the big guns yeah. here in town He's got in, a, in his gun shop area. He's got a little little garbage can thing that's full of you know extra uh, tubes. And and I asked him one time, I said, "How many of these things do you actually?" He goes, "Oh, he goes if we don't if we don't sell five or six of these a month, the guys that come in and lost their tube, whatever, you know." And and I was like, "Wow, I, it's it is a problem, you know." It's but I'm not a big fan of it. I'm I'm a side gate person myself. Um, you know, I I get why they do it, and but it's not. All my using guns are all are all have solid magazine tubes and just use the loading gate. Yeah, I, I definitely want the side loading gate. Uh, I, I definitely I would I don't want a gun that does not have that option. Uh, but I see I, I do like the concept of having both on the gun. Uh, but I've never lost the mag tube off of one. Never had that problem. Um, uh, I, I, you mentioned the Smith and Wesson. I've seen a couple of the promo pictures of it, but I've been so disinterested that I didn't even really look at it to see what it was. Yeah, people would I, be surprised I, how you can download. Um, so older Henry, um, I am not able to use Lever Revolution in this, um, because of just with the tube, it won't work. Now you know. The normal 405 grain 4570 that I have for my sharps, I can load this gun no problem. The uh, jacketed soft points, I can load them, but that lever revolution just will not load into this gun unless I'm single loading through the ejection port. And, And people would actually be surprised how you could download a tube on a lever gun, the magazine tube with a Sharpie or a doll rod or a pencil of some sort to actually just life is easy. You know, it's not hard. They just got to kind of seek the information out because it's here. We've talked about these things, you know, it's not a hard task to do, but yeah, here we are again. On the 336 that I bought in high school, I can just press the loading gate. Yeah. Yeah. A round will pop out and I can take a round out that way. And pull them out. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I have I have seen yeah. others where that became a little more problematic. Yeah. But for my own personal gun, it's not an issue. All my yeah, all my ninety fives and three thirty sixes, I can I can unload like that too. No yeah. problem. Yeah. It, it became an issue for me early on after, before my hand surgeries with the carpal tunnel and all the other issues that I've had and you know required pretty good surgeries. But that was an issue, right? I was like, man, there's got to be an easier way. Then I got, you know, my buddy's grandfather, who's, you know, was a steam fitter for a hundred million years, who still hunts with his 32 special that he just, he can't press, right? He, he doesn't have the strength or the dexterity. I'm like, this is all you need right here. Sharpie, do this. He's like, 
where was this 10 years ago? You, you know, the round started flying out of the gun kind of thing. Like we, we get it, but he's like, oh, that just made a world of difference instead of him sitting there in the cabin or the tent, you know, you know, running every round out, jacking them out of the gun kind of deal. Uh, there, there's ways, right? There's, there's things about it, but they you don't, know, after my surgeries, it was, it was much better again for me to start doing that. But I start looking at these things and go easy loading gate feature, man, just, just make it easy. Hmm. No, I, I, I agree with all of you guys. I, I'm not a fan of the tubes. Um, You know, the, one of the other issues is that now you have the issue where they dent or on Henry's, they have a they have a roll crimp that holds in your um holds in your follower and right. i've had them work out um like cuz it's just a brass tube you know so i i think there's a lot of one of the other problems that's kind of now that we're you know now that i'm modernizing lever guns right one of the issues you run into is when you put a suppressor on there now you lose that feature entirely right or if you're putting a suppressor mount Right. If you're going to put in ASR, or pretty much any kind of, you know, center fire mount that's not a, a uh, trilug, yep. you've lost the ability to utilize that tube anyways. And I mean, I I always tell my customers, I'm like, listen, that's kind of a feature because you don't want to use that anyways, because all you're going to do is induce ways to break your gun. Now, losing yeah. the tube, that's some new stuff that I've never heard before. And it makes oh, yeah. a ton of sense. <laughs> but I that's that's cool. I never I haven't heard that before. That's that's neat. Mar Marlin model sixty when I was twelve. Trust me, still laid in the squirrel wood somewhere, man. It's still laying there in the squirrel wood somewhere <laughs> to this day. Or some dude found one thing. It's like I got a spare. So, <laughs> you know, thirty some years ago, forty years ago, the guys like terrible. I'll never live that day down in my life ever. Still to this day. So yeah. I think, you know, part of it, part of it too, with the modernizing of the guns, it's allowed us to do, you know, like spare ammo carriage. Yep. I, you know, a million years ago, we did the same thing like we did with shotguns, right? We put a Velcro on the side of the gun with a 4570 loop. You know, I, I went through and did a design on an actual side saddle for a lever gun for a while. It's just one of those things that go, why we're doing Velcro, right? It, it doesn't matter. Now you've got all the hop tech carriers, um, I mean, Midwest has their own carrier as well, which I absolutely love the guys at Midwest. Troy and his crew are amazing brains on how they do this stuff. And it's like, yeah, this is all great. I'm like, when is the last time I needed all that ammo hunting? I'm like, I don't know. I, I put five to 10 rounds in the gun and I went out and I shot two deer and I'm, I'm, I'm good. You, you know, but I, I like on a working gun, it's important, right? You got to have spare ammunition to the gun, at least enough of a complement to reload the gun based on the caliber. That's the way I feel about it. I like all these things, right? We we have we have the abilities to do some fun stuff with these guns and make them more user friendly. So one of the interesting things that I think comes with modernizing the lever guns, right? And I, I hate the term tactical lever guns because to me it's like tactical. It, it's meant in a degrading way, frankly. Um, and Settle down, Karen. Not that I'm personally offended. I just think it's we're trying to make something a little bit more useful, right? That's kind of the point. Yeah. We're taking modern things that make a older design a little more up to date, you know. Yeah. And like on, so I, this is like a Henry single shot, right? So like Steve was saying, you know, Velcro right on here. Yeah, see, that's cool. But then that's one of the Hill West one. ones. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one's a Grim Hunter Tactical. Yeah. yeah, exactly. All the leather ones that are out there, like, is it like Buffalo Boar Leathers? Yeah. yeah. Leather guys have Buffalo in their name. But, you know, I also have to run nickel-plated rounds in that leather. So Yes, you do. <laughs> yeah. You don't have that problem with the plastic. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I mean, I've got the elastic shell cards from Brown Coat, Brown Coat Tactical yeah. on my work 336. Yeah. Like, one there. of the issues that, yeah, like one of the issues we run into though with these things and like the guys at Midwest and Chisel Machining and all the other companies that are making parts to kind of bring these guns a little more contemporary is that we're asking these designs to do something they were never designed to do. Right. And so, you know, the the Rossi being like a prime example, the 
Rossi's magazine tube is thin. Yeah. It has a bow in it. It's just the way it is. And then you try to put a handguard on there. And the same thing is true of a 336 or an 1894. Well, that handguard tenon that's on the barrel of like uh like a Marlin 1894, if it has one, was never really designed to support a handguard. It was designed to keep a handguard cap in place. And that's about it. And now we're asking these things to do things they weren't designed to do. And we have to figure out how to work around that and how to modify things. And, you know, it, it's an interesting problem set that I happen to enjoy trying to trying to work a way around. Um, and I think at this point, we probably we've got a good head around it. But when you're building these guns, like, you know, these are. These things require people that know what they're doing with them. It's real easy to break a lever gun. Mm -hmm. It's not an AR, man. They're not. I mean, I sell parts too, right? But um, yeah. I think it, it's an interesting problem set. Yeah. So that brings up a question I have for Jason. <clears throat> Jason, how many uh, lever guns have you have? How many special editions have you put out of lever guns? You know, surprisingly, not a ton, only mm -hmm. because uh, Henry traditionally doesn't do them. Uh, they pretty much stick with the catalog stuff. And then Marlon was, you know, out of pocket for so long. Uh, I, I didn't even bother when Remington owed them because I, I didn't, I didn't even, I didn't even want to go down that road because I, I didn't want to. I had to send a call tag with every one of them. But uh, um, and now that you know, but obviously we were, we've been working on some stuff with. Uh, you know, some ideas, kicking around some ideas with Marlin and, 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 and things like that. Rossi, we had we tried to work on some things with those guys, but again, up until about the last a year or two years, they their production was always just sold out for the year. There was never really a lot of availability in production time to do special editions. Um, but now that's changing as we're seeing more and more of these companies add add more to it. And look, it's look, these guys, they're all trying to diversify. They all are trying to get out of being so hardcore on AR-15 stuff because if something happens, they don't want to be caught flat-footed. So they're all yeah. riding the way, but they're also they're they're not uh, they're not bashful about saying, "Hey, we'd love to have something that potentially we're not having to worry about. Is this is this going to be regulated differently, or this state going to ban it?" I mean, now you've got AR companies having to have four different SKUs of the same rifle to be compliant in all these yeah. different states, different yeah. mag capacities. It's it's a hassle, and so I think you're seeing a little little development there. Just to uh, that's why we're seeing so many of these rifles now that are magazine fed lever guns. I mean, we're seeing AR. You know, I think was it Bond Arms and Arrow Precision. I think both had AR mm -hmm. POF fed. also. Yeah, no, uh, a Arrow doesn't. Arrow has an 1895 clone. <laughs> yeah. what it is. I, somebody was some. Uh, I guess no. I guess Henry had a. Uh, Henry had an AR magazine 223 lever action version this year. 223 and 300 blackout. Yeah. Yeah. So you're seeing that kind of crossover now, too. So I think you're going to see more product development going that way. I think these manufacturers are talking about with what uh, Steve, Steve was talking about with the, um, having to adapt these guns for the modern uh, pieces and, and parts. I think you're starting to see some some work there to get away from just having it set up where you got a magazine tube with a hanger and you've got a four end cap and and a, and a wood stock. So I think there's going to be more of that coming. Hmm. I mean, you make a really good point too, Jason, which is that for the last few years, like people ask us all the time, like, what do you recommend? And I'm never going to give that answer. But um, what I will say is that, and what I tell everyone is, what can you find, right? Like, mm -hmm. what can you find that is out there? Because if I tell you that my favorite is uh, Henry X and 4570 or Marlin 1895 GBL, can you find that rifle? Because for the past five, six years, the answer is no, you can't. So it's what can you find? And then we can work with what you got, basically. But now you're right. That is starting to change, you know, and we're there's a lot of really cool stuff that's going to be coming down the pipe. You could go to any any gun store, any pawn shop around and find a Marlin or a Winchester rifle for three, four hundred bucks. And there was a while there you could oh. find them for under three hundred bucks, pretty much any day of the week. 
that I mean, those days are gone. I mean, gosh, dog. I mean, for a while there, you had just bone stock three thirty six Marlins that were nothing special. They were selling for twelve, fourteen, fifteen hundred bucks on Gun Broker, and people were getting it. Maybe sixty yeah. bids on. It. And so, yeah. I mean, that's who was winning that. those bids. What's that? Did you ever see who was winning those bids? Well, like the no. same four shops. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would that. No, I'm I'm serious, right? Like, and you know, not throwing shade to those those shops, but that's what they did. Is yeah. they would then buy guns, they would do a minimum of work, make it look like this, and then sell it for more than we sell stuff for. It goes right yeah. back on Gun Broker, and it killed the secondary market. Yes, and it it's crazy because now you try to like. People can't get over the fact that, like, just a stock, like, you know, they're like, well, this is a $300 rifle. I'm like, no. Ten years ago, this was a $350 rifle. When I got into this, this was a $350 rifle. Now it's a $900 to $1,200 rifle, and that's not going to change. It's the same the with market revolver. market has man. drastically changed. Well, it's the same with revolver, too. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, you, you paid you paid way more for an auto pistol than you did a, than a revolver. And then that's about, you know, 20 years ago, that started to flip. And a lot of it's labor, too. Look, every one of these manufacturers is struggling to get any type of skilled labor anymore. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to go to the factory for 20 bucks an hour. You know, and you get places like, you know, traditionally where a lot of these gun companies are, are located, like Ruger up in New Hampshire. I mean, they have like the lowest unemployment in the world is in that part of New Hampshire. And there's just not a lot of people there. I mean, it's out in the middle of nowhere. So it's hard to find people that they can get. And, you know, no, none of these young people want to go and do it. So a lot of the reason why polymer uh, polymer frame pistols and AR-15s have been so prevalent is because that's what they could hire people to make. And um, You go in these factories and you see a, a, an area that's the size of maybe a, you know, a decent, like a, you know, 10,000 square feet. And they're building all their striker fired pistols in this area. And then there's 80,000 square feet where they make a quarter of revolvers in that same area. Mm -hmm. It's just the amount of machinery it takes, the people, all the labor. It's all puzzles out are easy. Puzzles yeah. are easy. Yeah, they're easy. Exactly. So, puzzles are easy. Puzzles are easy. And I think that's another part of it too. But like the the other thing about these guns that I dig, they are so easy to chop in SBR. Yeah. That's what makes a lever, like that's the other thing with a lever gun. Like I don't have to worry about putting an adjustable gas block. Is this right? Is this right? Like no, man. Here, here's my stamp. Do this. Like I, I want this thing to be a ten and a half inch, forty four mag integral suppressor or whatever. Uh, it's like me and Rob Hot were having this talk a while back about some stuff with some of our fun guns, like the seventy seven forty fours and all kinds of weird things, seventy seven thirty three fifty sevens and all the weird guns that we you know just chopped up and played with over the years ago. But it's so fun for you know four hundred dollars between a two hundred dollar stamp and you know two hundred dollars worth of work to cut the barrel recrown it and just have this cool little gun and either chop a tube down or whatever like man they're a fun gun to sbr and turn into little shorty guns they really truly are and they're still super capable even with a 10 and a half inch 11 inch barrel yeah especially at pistol calibers yeah for sure yeah yeah, yeah. i mean what is it like 44 mag 357 once you hit 16 inches you're really not getting much more out of that barrel right nope so, I mean, I feel like Fred would probably know more about that than I would, but um, I yeah. just... It's the beard. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, 14 and a half is life, man. That that 12 to 14 inch length is life on some of these little guns, on some of these carbines, in the lever guns. It really is. We do, we do 11 and a half on our 357 SBRs, and uh, we do 12 on our... We, we do 4570 SBRs. Uh, yeah. Tucked can inside the handguard. I mean, they're... America. <laughs> Yeah, it's great. Yeah. You're going to cost me money now, Steve, because now I'm thinking of looking at this Rossi going, yeah, 11 and a half inch 357. I'll kill a lot of deer in the tree stand with that thing. It's going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be real bad for me. Thanks. Appreciate you. Yeah. What What are you knocking the capacity well, down to then with an 11.5? I think six. So, um, so 357s generally around six. Uh, yeah. The 4570s, three to four. Like I, I am not saying it is a super it practical gun. Sucks. <laughs> it does. Yeah. It does, yeah. right? But you know, for the handful of people that want us to do that, you know, it's not their only gun. Like Steve said, there yeah. are fun guns. And, I'll, I'll be real. That's you know. the if, if there's a lever gun I want, it's a shorty boy with a big old suppressor 
going subsonic out of the barrel like that that's that's yeah. pretty damn cool look yeah. you haven't lived till you've heard a nine millimeter suppressed lever gun I haven't like really lived at all, to be honest. So yeah, <laughs> that's true. Not a hard that's hard right. But, He's but, twelve, but running a bunch of one fifty syntax or like the one sixty five or one eighty five grain, whatever. They, oh my god, it's stupid, like stupid, yeah. stupid, quiet. We worked up a load for our thirty eight special. I think we put it was a one hundred eighty grain flat point. We right, we loaded it with some Trail Boss to you know a ten fifty, and literally it makes you never want to shoot a three hundred blackout suppress again. Because a little 357 lever gun like that is so much more fun, and it's oh, yeah. it, it, it's quieter. You don't get gas blowback. There's no, you know, you know, does it work with this? And they got this buffer. Oh, that's bullshit. Yeah. It just yeah. It just works lever, and you start shooting those. It's a it's a blast. So fun, so much fun. That that oh, that that brings me up to the other point. Like, when are we going to see the dudes? And I know it's a lot of work because I've talked to Steve about this before. Like, like I'm a 10 millimeter guy. Like I'm a big 10 mil dude. Like, like, and I have like literally done everything to either punch Brett in the head at Rossi about this. I'm like, build me a 10 millimeter lever gun is all I want. Like I want <laughs> for no other reason than the fact I carry 10 millimeters and I hunt with 10 millimeters a lot, especially most of my hunting pistols are 10 millimeters. I'm like, man, I just want a 10 millimeter lever gun dog. That's all I want. I don't care, but I just want one. And I missed the boat a bunch of years back when some other people were doing them. And I'm kind of glad I did miss the boat, but like I want a 10 millimeter lever gun, man. I, I really do. Like I miss the days when guys were actually building them in nine millimeter, which was a pain in the ass. I know. And they were super expensive at the time. Cause it's a super short throw. Like I get it, but man, just give me, it can be 10 millimeter Magnum. I don't care. Like I just want a 10 millimeter. He's not being subtle about it. I think that was a, a strongly worded no. request. <laughs> oh, it was. And Steve knows that we've had this talk. <laughs> I, That's cool. I, well, yeah, I, I, think dirty things with it. I think you'll see that in the near future. I know we will. <laughs> Everything's coming. So. I, 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 I know a lot this year at Shot Show in the near future and last Shot Show. It's coming. It's it, coming. It'll be here next next quarter. The, the the other one, the other one for a lot of us in like the straight wall states, yeah. like some of the straight walled states. <laughs> believe it or not, because of the overall cartridge length, you cannot use a forty five seventy in the restricted deer yeah. zones. So yeah. it's like that leaves us again, you know, which is fine. 44, 357, 454, 45 long cold. I don't care. We, we killed deer with them. But I'm like, just give me a good 350 legend or a 450 Bushmaster in a lever gun. Yeah. I know, but it's coming soon. So, you, you no, know, I, but I make, I make 450. Those, that's a conversion I do do is the 450 Bushmasters. Um, actually, I, yeah, yeah. We'll talk after this. I've got one. Um, but those are, those are great. Like, because you can build those, we'll say fairly easily when you know what you're doing, right? So, um, but yeah, we have barrel blanks made up by Douglas for those, and th those are cool. I do like those. I, I know. <laughs> That's the other one on the list, too, is a 450 lever gun. Because See, what we're talking about, our, uh, our insane, crazy, quirky request, the one that I've always have always bugged about was, I, I, one of these days, I'm going to have a custom-built Marlin in, in 45 auto rim. Because it's yes. a little bit in the case, it's yes. short. You could probably put fifteen or sixteen of them in there. Yes. And with the when you load that thing right, it's like a forty man. You could hammer stuff with that thing. Yeah. It would be the you coolest know, you, deal ever. You, you might as well make one in forty five gap at this point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Marley three, three fifty seven sig. Ruger, yeah. Ruger yeah. if you're listening, fifty seven sig. Yeah. Ruger, if you're listening, I'm easy to please. I just want a 16 inch barrel 30 30 with a 12 and three quarter to 13 inch stock. That's all I need. You'll make me happy. I'm not extravagant like these guys. That's right. I just introduced that's the like, 16 inch 30 that's 30. That's the trapper, man. That's out. Yeah, it's, the trapper 30 30 is out. It's out. Yeah, yeah. the trapper they 30 they've got, they've got the long stock on them. Well, you can cut so that. Get a, get a chop I don't saw. want to. I don't want to have to do any work. I want to take it out of the box and it be exactly what I want. This is America. I should be able to get exactly what I want from the manufacturer and not have to do anything. Let me I, tell that's you what why I guys want. like me exist. <laughs> yeah, so, I, so, this, so this is this is where I'm at with this too. Is Steve is like, I need you to make an adapter to take the Magpul shotgun stock on a lever gun. Yeah, that's all I know. Yeah, you yeah. know that, that that would make life amazingly great. It I really did. Would. I did several years ago trade into a Marlin 336Y in 3030 that had the youth stock on it. And I was like, oh, That's my word. Good. I have finally found yes. my Nirvana. This Great is gun. perfect. 
Yeah, and, and going to Jason, what you were talking about, you know, the the handiness of it, the getting out. Oh, this is perfect. And then I went out and shot it, and in the five rounds, it was so hot that I couldn't handle it because yeah. the metallurgy on it was so bad, and the action on it was so awful. Now this was in the bad years, like the the yeah. rapid decline years of Marlin. You know what helps with that? The Midwest rail with, with yeah. the top cover. Yeah, but this is wood stock. It's it, <laughs> I know. it, it looked like you a real lever a decision, gun, lady. not some space you can't lever have gun. It both ways. Yeah, and I, I thought this was going to be finally. This was my gun, and it just it disappointed me so. Uh, no, wait. There was a company. I, was it Champion? They made that polymer stock that was in the youth length. And you could get the whole set for 50 bucks. And I think their molds just wore out because they just stopped yeah. making it. And I, I have, have hounded it. people for years to make that again. Make that stock. And oh, I, I do have a polymer stock on a 3030 that has been cut down. And it is perfect. But I don't want that to go through doing all of that again. I just want it to go. But uh, guys, I've enjoyed it. I need to get running because I got to get get. We'll see you later. Got to go do adult stuff before I go to bed. Uh, I'll just leave with this. In the most recent lever gun class that I ran, I did an experiment. Uh, as everyone comes up, we start the class of show and tell, let everybody show their gear and everything. I had a set of really nice uh, uh, hollow ground screwdrivers there, so we wouldn't mess up anybody's screws. And we had everybody tighten the screws on their lever gun before we started class. And then at, after the lunch break, before we started shooting again, I had everybody go around and tighten them all again. And that was the first class that we did not have a gun go down to malfunction. Even when we just telling people, hey, check your screws, do whatever. It would still have problems. Daryl Bulky came to, I did it at TACCOM one year with some Brockman worked over lever gun because you know Daryl. Oh, yeah. And a screw backed out on him in, the, in this little two-hour block and his gun locked up. It's just as simple as taking a nice, nice set of screwdrivers Ooh. and tightening those screws, and you can eliminate a lot of the problems that you would have. And, you know, guys, I appreciate it. I'll, cool. I'll catch the rest of this on, on uh, the podcast. But, uh, yeah, Lee. I got to run. See you guys. Thanks for making it on. That, that's why, like, I'm also one of those dudes who's like, when I start pulling that stuff apart and putting things back together, I'm all about the Macure comb glue. <laughs> Give me a little Vibratite, just a little dab on those screws. It's, it looks like Macure comb. I mean, for those of you that remember that stuff, right? Like, but yeah. but that's it. Like, just a little dab on on the screws with some of this stuff, and it goes a long way on those guns. I mean, we used to use clear nail polish at that point. Yeah, oh, one hundred percent. Especially if you're running them hard. Yeah, one of the new things that's come out, um, because like Lee brought up, like using the precision ground screwdrivers and stuff like that, and you know we yeah. we grind our own screwdriver sets and stuff like that. We use the Brownells ones, but um. Torx heads now. I really like the Torx ones that are out there now because they're just so much more functional. Um, and you know, you can do witness marks, you can do all sorts of stuff. Every gun we build, we we blew Loctite on on those. Um, there's a couple of screws we will red Loctite on, like so your sights don't fly off on Henry's. Yeah. Um, kind of important. But, yeah, yeah. On Steve's, I may have used a little too much, but. Uh, it's, I will attest. You don't need that safety to work, like, anyways. I don't need that safety to work. I've been running a lever gun without a safety for years. I don't care. It's stupid. Worst thing they could ever put on these guns. Lawyers. Dumb. Yeah. I, I love this gun. Like, I, I like this is the one gun that I generally grab for ninety percent of my hunts. Is, is this guy here when I can? Like, it's it's absolutely just that gun for me at this point. It's just awesome. I do enjoy it. I think there's one thing with these that a lot of people don't realize, especially if they're not around them or haven't handled with them, handled them. They can be tiny, oh, absolutely yeah. so slight, so thin, oh, yeah. so short. Um, so thin here, like that. Yeah, this is 94 that's and 357, and I don't know if you can see it real well, but this mount is one that Ashley uh, Emerson designed. It's an yeah. Ashley out precision. This thing mounts a scope so low, it is freaking awesome. Because you can still carry yeah. it around like this, no problem. It's, it uses uh, extra low double dovetail Leupold rings, and you can put a two and a half Leupold on here. Yeah. I mean, it's 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 money. You could actually put a two to seven or a two and a half to eight on here with just lows, and you don't have to uh, you don't have to use a hammer extension on there because it rides forward. 
Yeah, you, know, you can keep these guns really tidy, and this gun will do oh, yeah. in the hunting woods down here. Everything, everything. So th there is nothing that a 357 44 mag lever gun cannot handle in most of the United States for hunting. That there is only, even parts of Africa, like I've seen it. Like, like there, there are some guys. <laughs> they get challenged. They have some fun. You know, after their ninth, tenth trip to Africa, and they start bringing different weird guns and stuff like that to kill little things, but uh, mid-sized animals. But I'm like. Man, dude, like I'll tell you, there there is not much that that three fifty seven mag or forty four mag and a lever gun cannot handle here in the United States. I agree, and, and that three fifty seven mag uh, Rossi is one of those tiny. I've handed it to friends, yeah. and they're like, "Was this a twenty two? No, that's a three fifty seven magnum." And when you it, shoot thirty eights or three fifty sevens, they're both pleasant. It is my favorite spot and stock gun for deer, uh, outside of an old model six hundred Remington that I have like in 308 but this is like my favorite just spot and stock walk around the woods gun like stuff and full of shells and don't need to carry anything extra with it and that's it like this is just the greatest walkabout deer gun that i've got little literally like it is a blast with a little red dot on it when i'm in the thick woods and the marsh bottoms and stuff and the, and the cattails like it is absolutely outstanding love this gun for that So we talked about big loops. That was actually one of the things I wanted to discuss, and you guys hit it out of the park. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, off the top of your guys' heads, are there any, and this was part of the question I wanted to ask Jason, but I'm going to open it up. Uh, are there any must upgrades? If you yes. have a brand new lever gun, you got to do this to it. Yes. Steve, what, what you got? Uh, especially on any of my wood stock or polymer stock guns, the sling swivels have got to get reinforced, the studs. Uh, they've got to get epoxied in. I don't care if I got to sink another chunk of dowel rod back in there and redrill it or something. But usually for me, it's like epoxy. Like they've got to get epoxied in. Uh, guys start hunting with these things. They twist them around. The swivel studs start to work themselves out, especially on some of the wood and the hollow core stocks. Uh, first thing I do to all mine is I epoxy them in. That is like one of my first and foremost with these guns to do. Cool. Jason? Yeah, for me, usually it's sights. Um, I'm not a big fan of the buckhorn sights, so I'm a yeah. big fan of the uh, Skinner uh, peep sights or the XS sights. I've got both of them on guns and like both for different reasons. Um, that really, to me, is the big thing. Um, usually, I'm not a fan of crescent butt plates, so any rifle that has a crescent butt plate, usually I'll have it cut and then, and then put a pad on it or something like that to get to get rid of it. But other than that, I, I run mine pretty pretty stock. Um, pretty, I like to, keep, mine are mostly for utility, uh, and for, and for hunting. So I try to keep them thin and light. Um, I got three boys. And so if you, my youngest, my older two, they hunt on their own now. They're old enough to do that. But my youngest, he's just on the verge of being able to hunt by himself. So usually I'm, I take him with me. So carrying a little light lever action is, is nice. He's going to be one doing the shooting, but if I want to bring my wife too. So usually I'll just use one of these 357 or 44s that I have that I'll just because it's light, easy, doesn't take up a lot of space. They're great for how if you gotta go track a deer or something like that, if somebody shoots one or whatever. Um, I do like the little Skinner uh has a, a nice little light uh, mount that you can put around the mag tube. It works pretty well. Um so I, but I keep mine pretty pretty basic. I, I'm not a big fan of goal of, of round bead sights. I like more of a square post. Yeah. Um, I like a white stripe. Um, I, I love that excess uh, front sight because I like to use, be able to perch the what I'm shooting at at the top of the of that post and not cover it up with a gold bead. A gold bead on a on a fairly small target, you get out there at hundred dollars, it covers it up. Um, mm -hmm. and so I, I like a square top front, but the, but I do like a fairly fairly open um, aperture rear sight. Fred, no. I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay. I, I, I think one of the other ones too for me was like on, on this older 44 that I've got on, on this Marlin was like because of the scope setup that I have it on, I needed a hammer spur, right? So I make sure I lock tight down the hammer spur. And it's funny you mentioned the old buckhorn sights, right? Because like it's kind of hard to see, but I used to paint the top of them. Like I would paint them with white paint or yellow paint or whatever. Now I've gotten to the point where like some of my other ones, like I've just replaced the fronts with fiber optics you know, with a green or red fiber that I can actually see with it. But my old buckhorns on this one are definitely painted when I could actually see sights pretty well or in low light. And yes, that is a Schmittenbender short dot on a Marlin 44 mag just to like hurt people's feelings. But it worked. It was like the it. closest scope that I had laying around. You know, guys like, how does that work? I'm like, 
the scope, you zero it, you shoot things with it just because it's whatever. Uh, but that was that was the big one. And barrel band, the barrel band sling mounts. Oh, Uncle Mike's, I love to hate you sometimes. But yeah, uh, silicone pads under those. So they get a little bit grippier on the uh, tube. Mm. Like the ones Magpul uses on the shotgun stock, on the shotgun ones, you just get little silicone sticky pads. You can probably buy them on Amazon now, but I literally put them underneath there when I tighten it down. That is always a big plus to keep those things from sliding around. Steve, so, do you have uh, anything? Well, I mean, I replace like everything on my gun. So Wait, I'm you do? What? To ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, it's like your business me, or something. Yeah. Well. Um. So for me, uh, if we're talking about Marlins, then I would say uh, triggers. Um, mm. I don't. I'm not a. I mean, and I I can do a pretty good trigger job, but it's not worth it because you can just go spend a hundred dollars on the Wild West Guns Happy Trigger, throw it in there, and be very happy um that to me is a very simple straightforward upgrade that makes a ton of difference um and uh i don't know as, as far as like upgrades you know we i like we we make a i mean i guess it's shameless promotion but like we make a uh, we make a toolless takedown lever screw um I like that because some of the other ones that were on the market, we I I was using them a lot before I started making my own parts. This was the first one we ever made, and I just got tired of beating the crap out of my fingers trying to get things on and off. So we designed it so that the three, because you're going using three fingers, right? Um, and it just fits. Um, I like that so that then you have easier access when you're maintaining your lever action rifle. Because I mean, really, as far as maintenance goes not saying that you shouldn't it's your gun you can do whatever you want but you're probably going to do more harm than good if you don't know what you're doing by taking the complete rifle apart to, um all you got to do is pull the bolt out clean it and that's that's pretty good man you're not getting the kind of round counts for the most part where you need to do more than that and if you are generally you know what you're doing um but uh to me the midwest industries handguard though is a is a big one you know, it, it's certainly not for everybody. I understand that. You know, my style of gun is not for everybody, but uh, it makes a big difference in how the gun feels, how it handles. And then if you want to do something with different stocks or whatever, you can do that. You know, we use these really nice wood stocks from Form Rifles in the UK that we import. Um, and they're, you know, adjustable comb, beautiful wood. Um, so for people that want like a, a nice wood stock they come straight grip pistol grip but the, those things are great i mean you're paying for them unfortunately but um yeah, yeah. I, yeah. It, the cool thing now is there's so many options out there yeah. it really depends on what you're trying to do with the gun you know yeah. I, I think most the most of this conversation with you guys yeah has kind of centered around hunting right i mean i i don't hunt so for me a lot of that stuff just doesn't yeah I'll, one day i'll come visit you you can teach me how to kill things you're not my friend anymore i don't like you i know it's not it's that I have anything against it. I've just never done it. <laughs> you're fired. You're fired. You're fired. Go away. Yeah. You're fired. So, I do, um, another thing that I do to my guns too is I is I get rid of the stupid cross bolt safeties on them. My Marlins. Uh, yeah. With the, uh, I bought a bunch from Turn. At one time, Doug Turnbull was selling uh, Turnbull. plugs. Yeah. So I use those. But but a quick fix you can I've done too is just put them into fire position and get there's a certain size uh, rubber O ring. And it'll snap right over that little groove, and it that actually works really good if you don't want to permanently alter the gun, um, and it'll keep it in a fire position. But you got the option to to easily, you know, put it back on safety if you deem necessary. But that that's worked. I've got those on a couple guns that I've used pretty hard, and that actually has worked pretty well. Can I tell you a trick on how to how to do that? Blue if you don't want to use the O ring, yeah. Pull this screw out, take the stock off, and there's a set screw right there. Oh, uh, yeah. Put the safety on whatever you want, on put it on fire, and tighten that set screw down. That thing will never move. It, it's really that. And it already has Loctite on it, except for Steve's, where I put a lot more on. And it was red. Um, <laughs> uh, you know. That's because he said he's not my friend anymore. <laughs> I don't care. But, I like um, him. That, that'll do it. Yeah. Uh, Beartooth Mercantile, they make a uh, a safety delete too, 
now um, that you can get in blued or stainless. So we use those when people request it. So my buddy John called me this afternoon. As no, no, he texted me this afternoon that uh, he got his hands on a uh, a lever gun, and someone asked, "Hey, can you work on this?" And had a good conversation about it, about how people, a lot of people, don't really pay attention to round counts or you actually clean these. And John just joined us. This is also John, AKA John the Fish Cop. So John, what did you wind up facing? What was it, and what was the extent of the? in quotes, uh, repair. Well, first off, sorry for my tardiness. I had to get the kids fed and all that fun stuff. So. And watered. And then my phone hates me. So all that fun stuff to add to it. But anyway, um, I had a buddy of mine that he asked me, he knows I like guns. Weird. We have friends that know us and know that we like guns. So they ask us gun questions. Well, he's a hunter ed instructor. And he loaned his Winchester 9422 to a student to use for their shooting test. And he was worried that the student had done something to, to break it because he went to, you know, put it back in the battery. The lever wouldn't go all the way back to the stock. The bolt wouldn't go back all the way. And he's like, I don't know what they did to it is this in your wheelhouse? And I'm like, sure, I'll take a look at it. And yeah, I pulled it apart and wow, is all I could say. I'm, I'm pretty sure that thing's seen nothing but, you know, just lead bullets and probably never seen anything as far as anything, as far as cleaning. And yeah, it was pretty exciting tearing into that and getting all the gunk out. In fact, every time I, I took a chunk out of it. I just had it on a, like a, a white cloth and was taking pictures as I was going just so I could send it to this guy to be like, dude, once in a while, maybe, you know, clean it up a little bit. And you get and, lead yeah. tested break, after that. Yeah. What's break, that you really break, you check break your cleaner. blood lead levels. After that? <laughs> Serious. I'm, yep. I'm fairly certain I need to get those tested anyway, but you know, I, it's damage is probably already done anyway. Yeah, it's all right. But, but yeah, anyway, it was just kind of funny that, you know, you know, I knew that this podcast was coming up and it was like lever guns. Like, this is ironic, you know, and it got me thinking, you know, why does it get so bad with these guns versus, you know, like bolt rifles? It doesn't seem like guys have as big issues, you know, with that type of stuff. And I think, well, bolt rifle, all you got to do is pull the bolt out and they're easy to wipe down. I mean, the cleaning is a breeze. People don't really get into the, the nitty gritty as, fig, as far as figuring out how to tear these things, just basically take them apart just for the simple things of cleaning. The, the internet so, is full of all these breakdown things and little books about like how to tear them down and do these. It's, it's amazing if you use this thing called Google or whatever it is you choose to use. It's the crazy. Yeah. Now. What's yeah. this? I think there's a bit of a, a victim, manual a lot of YouTube that happens videos. to come with it. So, but yeah, you know, those manuals that we, get in the box and we throw them in the garbage and we never look at them again I think so. weird but yeah anyway i got it all cleaned up put it back together and amazing it works just fine so Crazy it's, it, it's just kind of funny i i thought it was ironic that yeah i'm working on a lever gun on the day that we're going to be talking about lever guns so good times awesome. i gotta get out of here guys i got an appointment uh, with a truck, a truck i got an appointment with about 1800 miles ahead of me so yeah well yeah. thanks for joining us okay. steve it's always a pleasure, guys. I'll see you all soon. Be well. Uh, I'm about to have to Good pop out. See you. Pleasure. So before everyone also takes off, uh, Jason, do you have uh, time for a quick question? Sure. Yeah. And this will be a general question to everyone. With the brands that are out there, are there any things people should be aware of? This is where this company is really good. This is where one company may suffer or have some issues because... What are we looking at? So we have Rossi, we have Marlin, we now have Smith and Wesson, we have Henry, uh, POF, all things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we sell a lot of Henry's and we've been selling mm -hmm. Henry for a long time. And yeah, you know, it, I'm not crazy about some of their design features, but we generally don't have a lot of issues as far as those coming back. Um, 
he you know, heard pretty good things from the dealer side about it. Um, I'm not really privy to what Henry's customer service issues are or whatever, but as far as I, I do have a pretty good idea of, you know, what we get as far as returns and stuff. And Henry's actually not bad at all. Cool. Uh, the new Ruger Marlin stuff's been really, really good. Uh, we haven't had any real issues there. Uh, back when it was Remington, it was a train wreck. So this, you know, the last, I would say maybe the last two years of the Remington era Marlins, they weren't terrible. They they were, they had gotten better. Um, but man, with, with all the JM guns that are pre Remington buyout and the current Ruger versions, I would just stick with those just to be safe if it was me. Um, the current Winchester stuff, we don't get a ton of it. I don't make a whole lot of it, but it's what we've had has been okay. But just, but it's not really, I, we just don't see a lot of them. Mm. Uh, the Rossi stuff, the last couple of years has been really good. Um, haven't had any issues there. Um, I would, I, I've got a couple of Rossies and they serviceable guns. They're, they're a little rougher than the Marlins, uh, but they, they work and they shoot well. Um, but the Smith and Wesson's still too early to know. I mean, they really haven't really shipped. I, I ran, I played with one a little bit. Um, it shot fine. It worked good. Actually, the way that they they set that fore end up with the M lock and everything, it actually it's it works pretty good for it. It really bridges the gap of having some tactical, I hate that word too, features, but keeping a traditional look. Um, so so far, I mean, no complaints there. Um, I still think probably you're. The safest bet out there, if you, if you really want to get into it, is probably the Marlin. I think this is the most proven deal. It's going to have the most aftermarket support as well, and um, you know you can get everything you know from three fifty sevens to forty five seventies. When it comes to rimfire stuff, if you can find one of the old thirty nine A Marlins, those are great guns. Um, I'm a big fan of the ninety four twenty twos, the old one. I've got several of those. They just introduced a new one. It looks kind of Henry-esque in hmm. their build quality on that. But uh, got a couple of the Henry 22 uh, rifles as well, and they've been very serviceable guns. I haven't had any complaints with them. Cool. Yeah, in the middle of that last conversation, I texted uh, Adam Roth over at Eridus saying, hey, you busy? When we were talking about uh, aftermarket stuff. Then I also uh, texted uh, Brett Voorhees over at Taurus Rossi to say, just for him, for him to slap – uh, Steve Fisher, but yeah, he he's he must be doing oh, family things. Speaking of that, I forgot too. You know, they got the R ninety five out now. In, in which, one's the, which one's the ninety five? Yeah, I, mean, I tell you what, those guns are pretty decent. Um, we they they sent us a thirty thirty to mess around with when they first came out. We shot that gun a bunch, and I was really impressed with it. It was very smooth. It was really super accurate. Um, very Marlin friendly as far as components and rails and stuff like that. Um, and then we, I was at, at Taurus, I don't know, maybe three or four months ago and Brett had his 4570. We went out to the range and that thing shot great. Um, I, the R95 guns are, are pretty decent. I, I, I've been impressed so far with them. I think I did a good yeah, job. I'm, on. It looks I'm glad you brought that up, Jason. It's a, it's a Marlin clone, right? Like there's, there's a handful of differences with them. Um, you know, we, I gave them quite a bit of feedback on that when they first came out um, because, and a lot of it was really positive. The way they did a lot of things makes a lot of sense. Um, like when we were talking about like modernizing the the rifles to do things they weren't designed to do, that handguard tenant, one of the big problems with Henry's and Marlin's is it slides in that dovetail because it was never designed to take all the weight. It was captured inside the wood forend. Well, what Rossi did is they laser welded that in which is funny because then on a couple of Facebook groups, I'd see people telling me how difficult it is to remove that thing. I'm like, it's, it, it is welded. You got it out with a punch and a hammer. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're, uh, they're no, they did a lot of really good stuff really well with those guns. Uh, they have the 4570 ones that just came in. Um, they're, they're triple black line. Now I, I am really excited about those. Cause I think that's going to be, I mean, with Rossi, you're you have different quality levels, I guess you would say, like just with different production styles and things like that, right? Smith is Mim, Rossi is cast, Mim, um, Marlin, especially now the Ruger Marlins. One of the things that I, I really wish they would advertise more, and I tell them this all the time, but like 
you know, Ruger marketing is its own animal, right? Um, they have made consistent inline improvements to the Marlin line ever since they took it over. And no one really knows that because they don't talk about it. And I really wish they would. Um, simple things like putting a ring around the uh, bearing surface of the hammer to reduce hammer drag. Um, they did that. They, like, they do all these really cool things that unless you're, you know, you're really diving into these guns and taking a look at them and you have that frame of reference, you would never know. Um, and I feel like they do a big disservice to themselves to not say all the really great stuff that they're doing to constantly improve the guns. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, the, the cool you they go uh, wrong with Marlins. That when I that when I went and toured the Marlin factory in in North Carolina, that's the only factory line I've ever seen where they had the test firing apparatuses next to the production line. So instead of having to go haul guns, you know, to another part of the factory and, and do th they can actually they actually test fire right there. So if there's an issue, it's immediately recognized right there and they can they can approach things much quicker. It's they they really have done a fantastic job. I mean, that's one of the reasons oh, yeah. why there's no 70 Ruger 77s and number ones for a couple of years because all that talent that they had was, went down to North Carolina to help get those guys on par on how to polish how to fit, how to do all these things the correct way. And uh, so they, they spent a lot of resources to get that right. And they've done a good job with it. It's I, I, like I said, I've got a couple of the new guns and I have had nothing. That, that 45.7 that SBL, the original gun that they came out with, we shot multiple different loads through that gun. And that's a consistently an MOA gun at 100 yards, which I mean, for a, for a lever action 4570 with a one to four scope on it, I mean, that's pretty impressive. And to consistently do it with multiple loads with multiple shooters, I mean, it's a, it's a shooter. It, it works. Yeah, the R95s so, yeah. look very nice. Yeah, yeah. they did a nice job on those guns. Super nice. Yeah, like there are certain things that are interchangeable and there are certain things that are not because of like certain design compromises you have to make when you're dealing with, you know, castings and things like that. Um, but I mean, the difference is you see a much lower price point with them. And when we talk about price, we're talking about retail, not what people are selling them for on, you know, gun broker. Yeah. Um, so in terms of you get what you pay for, I think you get a lot of value out of the R95, um, like a tremendous amount, frankly. I agree. Yeah. John and I both have R92s and they've been fantastic and they are just so much fun to shoot. Definitely. That, they're, they're based on that Winchester 92 action with such a tidy, cool little action. Yeah. It's basically a miniature 1886 action. So it's got those two lugs that come up to the top, which makes it a super strong action. Of all those pistol caliber actions, it's, in my opinion, it's the strongest of all those. And and when their one's slicked out really well, it's just, man, that is such a slick little gun. And it's super short. I love the 92s. They're great guns. Yeah. So Everybody funny. that I've had shoot it man it they always got a smile on their face yeah like this is just fun i mean then and that's you know grown men to even my kids they're like this is awesome <laughs> well yeah new shooters it's a fantastic gun to put in their hands those little pistol caliber lever guns I mean, you can't beat them and, and to me the crazy thing is five years ago wouldn't even be on the radar <laughs> rossi or even taurus <laughs> But now this is this is pretty impressive. So I mean, there's a lot yeah. of a lot of talent that went to a lot of places. There is, yeah. After Remington died, so yeah. So Please. Jason, you got to take off. Yeah, yeah man, I got to roll. I, oh, I appreciate you having me on again, Matt. And it was uh, it was a fun one. I enjoy this. Lever yeah. guns are kind of one of my little favorites. So yeah, it's cool. Oh, Fred, you had something. I was. I wanted to ask Steve if he had any experience with the Italian-made lever guns that are. I mean, they are designed for the cowboy shooters, but where do they? Do you have any sort of opinion on their quality? Um, not a ton. Uh, so like the you're talking about like this. I always want to call them cinnamon. Uh, yeah. Uh, Simmer. No, it's not a stripper's name. Cimarron, Cim Cimar Cimarron right? Yeah, Cimarron. Um, Cimarron. They're doing some neat stuff. Um, I've never been, I mean, 
personal preferences. I've never been a huge fan of the top eject. I mean, one of the great things about the Rossi R92 is, man, that you'll send your rounds to space when you freaking you jack that. When you back. mean it. Um, yeah, yeah. Some very positive ejection. Um, <laughs> but uh, I don't have a ton of experience with them, to be honest. Uh, we we just kind of focus on the Marlin and Henry pattern which is why I like the r95s yeah. in particular the smith and wessons uh i do have a handful of those that are they're pretty interesting guns and i think there's a lot of potential there um there's a lot of really cool stuff they're smooth they're nice guns um i the i i understand the whole tube unloading thing especially from the hunting perspective um it really does nothing for me personally um but there's uh there's some interesting features they did with that there's a lot of stuff like i see how they did it for manufacturability because the way i'm looking at guns these days is what can actually get made right because we can talk about how great like in 1895 was or is but if marlin can only make so many of them well that doesn't help the guy they can't find one right because they're being scalped on gun broker or whatever um so in terms of Having been inside the Smith and Wesson guns and the R ninety fives, man, that's gonna. I think Marlin's gonna feel a little bit of pressure from that. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I work with all the companies. I work with Smith and Taurus and everybody else. Um, and it's pretty interesting to see how they how they solve the same problems sometimes in certain ways. Um, the Smith has. Uh, I mean, it's in 1894 on the inside. Like, I, I dropped a Wild West trigger inside one just to see if it would fit, and it worked. So, like, they are 100% compatible in certain aspects and then not in others. So, one of the interesting things, and I, I talked to Smith about this when we were at SHOT Show and they were showing us the guns, was uh, an Arrow 2, actually. They're like, you know, they, they recognize now that the aftermarket is driving the primary market a lot more than it ever has um and it's kind of interesting to hear some of the major manufacturers really embracing that um arrow i think is gonna do some really cool stuff we'll see how that works out um but uh, there's gonna be a lot more options on the market which is gonna be better for everybody it'll force those on the market to sink or swim either do better or you know find new innovative things and the uh you know, the new guys, they got to prove themselves. Competition will be, is, is good for this, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I agree, yeah. So I think we've now reached that point where it's time for final thoughts, plugs. Before we go there, I'm going to say my favorite thing. So you've been listening to this for a little bit now. You've got an idea of who these people are, what they're what they're about. Make sure you're supporting those sources that you found to be beneficial. Those algorithms are not working in a lot of our favors. Um, so we're heavily relying on you, the listener, the viewer, to help spread the word, um, help share this kind of stuff. If any of these guys on the panel or even others have shared stuff that you've benefited from, you like what they had to say, make sure you're giving them subscriptions. Make sure you're sharing. Make sure you're providing those likes. And that goes with this video. Don't forget to hit the like. Um, but truly that's, uh, it's kind of crappy the way, uh, some of us are being treated on the, that social media thing, because those things that we rely on, those algorithms really aren't doing those shares. So if, if you like this, make sure you're hitting, uh, hitting that like and sharing and, and also with our older stuff as well, because let's see here, this is episode 378. Yeah, we're well over a thousand hours of content. So um, with that in mind, since Jason has to take off, I'll start with you for uh, final thoughts and plugs. Yeah, I mean, final thoughts on lever guns is that if you've been thinking about getting one, go get a 22. Go start there. Yeah, I mean, it's just a great place to start. You can't go wrong. It's not expensive. Learn how to run one. You'll have a ton of fun. It's a great way to bring new shooters uh, in. It's... Um, it's a change up, especially for somebody. One of the guys mentioned earlier, their kids really enjoyed shooting it. A lot of people whose only exposure has been AR 15s or some type of semi auto rifles, you put a self actuated lever gun in their hand, all of a sudden it's, it's a new experience. And everybody that I've exposed it to that has really liked it. 
Once you go from there, to me, a 357 lever action is a great place to be because you can do a lot with it. It's a great personal protection caliber. It's a fun caliber to shoot. Uh, you can hunt with it. It's it, it, In a lot of ways, it's probably one of the most versatile long guns you can possibly own. Um, and then if you decide you want to start hunting with them, the sky's the limit. I mean, you can go from a from a, a, a you know a, a Browning BLR in, in 30 odd six uh, or a Henry Long Ranger in one of the Mary's calibers, or you can go with traditional with a 3030 or 4570, whatever you want. I mean, it, there's really no limits on what a lever action can do these days. So, but a 22 long rifle is a great place to start on it. Um, as far as uh, plugs, uh, check us out at lipsies.com. And if you're if you're an FFL dealer, that's kind of the place where you can go do all your business with us. Uh, if you're a consumer, we can go there and check out our exclusive options. We got over 200 and something exclusive firearms that that we offer. Um, we can go to lipsiesguns.com. It's kind of more of our content uh, page where you can find our podcasts and YouTube videos and reviews and all that kind of stuff. Um, social media, it's uh, Lipsy's Guns. Uh, I think uh, Instagram's at Lipsy Guns. Um, check us out. Same like Matt's saying. And the more we shares and likes you get, the more it gets spread because we get throttled just like everybody else. Um, yeah. Never thought, you know, we <laughs> that a, a 32 caliber J frame would have uh, yes. scared me as much as it did, but it did. <laughs> so, but anyways, um, go check us out uh, again, Matt. Thank you. This is a great venue. You always bring great guests on with with great. Uh, I learned a lot tonight too. It, it was it was really fun. I enjoyed everybody's uh, comments and, and feedback. It was great. I told you you'd be back. Ah, man, you got me hooked. <laughs> I know. It's like, what's next? Like, what's I have. Oh, no, no. I have other episodes that I'm thinking, okay, we need to get Jason back for this one. So, yeah. <laughs> Anytime. If I could be on here, I'll be it. Sounds good. Okay. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks. Here. Steve? Um, well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it. It's always fun coming to talk lever guns. Uh, yeah. You know, we... This was interesting because like I've done a few podcasts before and it was uh, really more tailored towards kind of the stuff I do. And this was very kind of different. It was more of the stuff that I'm not as exposed to, more of the traditional stuff that we don't do as much of. So it was fun to kind of hear some of the other perspectives with it um, and kind of how we fit into that. Um, as far as like plugs, you know, madpigcustoms.com, we have our, our e-commerce store there where we sell our everything from, you know, nickel teflon coated followers for your marlins to help kind of slick up the inside of your action and then uh our screws and various other things that you can you can do at home to your gun if you'd like um to full custom builds uh you can see us on instagram and uh, facebook at mad pig customs and uh yeah thanks for having us and so if people liked what you had to say about your own custom levers mm -hmm. is it possible to send in their lever gun to get it upgraded well, yeah. So, so like my lever in particular will be available for resale. Uh, we're, we're just uh, going through final prototyping. We made cool. some tweaks after shot show. So you'll be able to buy that right off my website. Um, cool. You'll be able to buy it through various, you know, distributors and other places um, like Midwest industries and places like that. Um, but uh, for right now, we're kind of nailing it down, but that's going to be released in probably the next four to six weeks. I should have production quantities. Uh, and you will be able to get that for your Marlin. Uh, so Marlin 1895-336 pattern, Rossi R95 and 3030-4570, um, 1894s, and then uh, Henry, uh, all pistol grip. We're not doing any straight grip right now. Um, and then uh, Henry in uh, pistol calibers and 4570, and the new Smith & Wesson. So all of that will be available very soon. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, having seen your stuff, not only, I think on Instagram, on Facebook, and then also people like Steve sharing it, it definitely, it, there's a, there's something to that. That's just cool. The, the work that you do. And it just seems Thank to me, much. it adds uh, additional functionality. And I'm all, I love functionality. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, we're not, it's not just to look like... cool though. It does. Yeah, like we, we try not to do like gimmicky stuff. You know exactly. what I mean? Like it's it's got to have a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Fred? Uh, hey, uh, Scarlet Fire Bushcraft is uh, my uh, YouTube page. And uh, you'll see 
everything, muzzle loaders, lever guns, long bows. But uh, I still have all my ARs. They just don't. They're 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 in uh, they're in a foot locker with Sergeant Lucas out in the garage. <laughs> now, how often do you do your uh, survival stuff with night vision, though? Oh, you know, I mean, I I take it on occasion, um, but uh, you know, it. Uh, I've not figured out uh, the filming with the night vision. I know someone yeah. that can help you with that. Okay. That, uh, that as a matter of be... fact, when we end, we can continue. We can we can talk that about that. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> Speaking of which, Brock. Hi, uh, I'm a random person, number two hundred forty-seven, that was pulled off the street, uh, and I listened in. It was entertaining. I said approximately forty lines of words, and uh, what's up? <laughs> and, and where can people find you? <clears throat> uh, Utah. Yes, yes. Also known as Brass Facts on YouTube. <laughs> There's a lot of really good content, and it's from the heart. As a matter of fact, I oh, think I, that I one, don't have one of those. Okay, that one clip I did uh, that I I released last week. So, yeah, last week you released was, a lot of clips from that. I did, I did, like, but there was wow. one where you, Chuck, and Hop were talking, and I think it was a great compliment from Chuck, just talking about you guys are just after real information and your own bias gets kind of pushed away and even if you don't like it you're still going to present what your what your findings were even if even if that does show that l can l can suck so you wanted me to come back to these or what's, 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 what's up with that that was uh <laughs> no as a matter of fact though that just released that episode today which didn't include the five clips that was a great discussion. It was great to hear you guys talk, and it was it was fun. So that's brass. I was, I was a, probably a little too drunk for that one. I was I was interrupting a lot of people. Uh, but you're fine. It, it's karma. That's what it is. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Hop and uh, Chuck Presper going ham on my my beloved Elcan was. Uh, <laughs> it, it was it was a bit much to take uh they say don't meet meet, meet your heroes because they'll, they'll they'll destroy you on the spot <laughs> no it was, it was it was a great it was a great uh it was a great it was a great podcast i, I love the it was fun the one yeah uh, you can't make contact with that guy he's ever elusive gosh yes we're talking about pressburg we'll, we'll get him we'll get him road trip have we tried smoke cycles yet yeah carrier pigeon is next <laughs> So speaking of road Jado trips, rockets. yeah, something. Speaking of road trips, John, I'm 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 what reminds you of road trips. Well, okay. you and I are driving <laughs> from Dallas back to Utah, and then we may have a road trip up to Idaho in the next couple months. So, but no, as far as this group goes, I'm random person number plus one of whatever he just said that <laughs> just pulling off the street. I'm. I'm a Get student three of this tacos stuff. together. There you go. There you go. We just happen to be at the same taco truck, All right? Well, yeah, I I like lever guns. I mean, as was said already, if you're looking to get into lever guns, start with a 22. And as far as me being a fish cop, you know, I got to put my plug in, get your 22 lever gun and go hunting. And a small game with a 22, it's fun stuff. We'll get into it and go after it. Um, they're just you, fun guns. You were also telling me turkey too. Depending on the season, you got to be careful what seasons you got to go there. Yeah, you got know, to watch out for the game wardens. They'll get after you. Yeah. Uh, here in Utah, you can you can hunt the fall turkey with rimfire. So twenty two, go after a turkey. It's good times. But yeah, like I said, I got to get a plug in. Go hunting. Well, yeah, and just happy to be here. So. Appreciate it. Cool. So <coughs> I'll cough. Uh, big thanks to our sponsors. Big thanks to Big Tech's Ordnance, Lucky Gunner, Overwatch Precision, <coughs> Filster, Primary Arms, Walther. Lastly, big thank you to the Patreon subscribers. If you go to patreon.com slash primary and secondary, you can help support the network. I say that all the time, but what exactly does it mean? It means primary and secondary has a lot of things going on simultaneously. Everything from podcasts, articles, a separate forum, uh, website, everything as well as hosting 
and editing software, all that. Uh, it takes time and money. It takes a lot of time. It's practically a full-time job. And a lot of it's it's kind of a one-man band thing. So that, it takes a lot of time. So if you like what, what, what I'm doing, if you like what we're doing, uh, consider Patreon. Um, Patreon.com slash primary and secondary to help support all of this. And it will go on. All of the resources that I have put together, that we have put together, this is free for your use. So if you can't support in financially, those likes and those shares really do count. Um, if you are kind of interested in doing the Patreon thing, if you start a dollar a month, you get ask, uh, you get access to Discord. We have a ton of channels, as some people have complained about, Brock. <clears throat> um, no. You got it's, a lot of channels. Like, we have a lot of channels. We do everything. Well, from... You got to keep up tradition for <laughs> the the Facebook group, right? Like if one channel for every half topic, right? It's true. And same with forum. So basically, I have the Facebook groups uh, arranged similar to a forum, as and the Discord Discord does the same. But great people are there. It's always moving. Uh, really, it's it's a it's a great community. Don't know what I have planned. I have a couple that are a couple uh, episodes that are just kind of floating around. Yeah, it's a break from last time when you had like I did four three. episodes: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah. yeah. Um. <laughs> basically, I, yeah, I have vacation coming up, so I need to make sure I have uh, some that? stuff to release. I know stuff to release while I'm out of town, but yeah, I still have all kinds of topics to discuss, all kinds of people to discuss them with. But these are an absolute blast. I love doing these. And I said this earlier too. Yeah, we've been doing this for, it's going on 10 years in December, which is crazy. Um, the forum is there for your use. Uh, there was a big Facebook blackout. Oh, it was horrible. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. Um, <laughs> when stuff like that happens, feel free to jump on the forum and, and we can talk about whatever. Um, it is a free resource, so... I think that's pretty much everything I got. I think I will end this. Oh yeah, another Patreon uh, subscriber benefit. If you're doing five bucks monthly, you get to watch these live. And then also as soon as they are done, as soon as I end the feed, it gets uploaded to YouTube and I turn around and, and um, provide that link to those Patreon subscribers immediately. So you get to watch me say, hey, this is what we're doing. Stand by, give it 10 minutes and then people will file in and talk and then past the ending, there's probably usually some post-discussion, which this episode, we will be talking about a couple things. So I think that's all. So uh, yeah, I'll talk to you later. <laughs>